Hello Grade 12, um, Metro North Education Dis this District and I, we're going to go through just some generalised tips for what to do when writing your chemistry paper to for physical sciences. Okay, so your chemistry paper is in two main sections, um, the first one being matter and materials, which is 58 marks. Matter and materials, 58 marks, which basically consists of the intermolecular forces stuff, which you kind of did in grade 11. And it's also question three of your exam, normally. The boiling point, the vapor pressure, the melting point of the organic molecules. And it's all your naming and organic reactions, everything organic. So 58 marks is intermolecular forces, which is normally actually included as part of the organic section. So basically this one will be question two. Question two will be naming an organic. Question three will be the physical properties of the organic molecules. And question four will be organic reactions. And that makes up 58 marks. The other 92 marks are included in a section called chemical change. And so chemical change is made up of um, balanced chemical equations and the quantitative aspects of chemical change, which is basically your stoichiometry, which you often find in your reaction rates question. So question five, reaction rates, will have stoichiometry in it. Question six, equilibrium, that might have some stoichiometry in it. And question seven, your acids and bases. These two are maybe your most um, stoichiometry heavy questions. Question five, reaction rates, and question seven, acids and bases. You also have energy and change, which is your exo and endo reactions. That will be in question five, mostly. Reaction rates, we talk about exo and endo. And rate and extent of reaction, that's also question five. And chemical equilibrium, which is question six. Chemical change also includes acids and bases and the electrochemical reactions. Acids and bases being question seven. And electrochemical being question eight and question nine. Your paper will always consist of nine questions. Question one being multiple choice. Two, three, and four are organic. Five, six, seven, eight, and nine will be reaction rates, equilibrium, acids and bases, galvanic, and then electrolytic. The stuff that was removed due to COVID restrictions is fertilizers, which used to be question 10, and polymers, which was part of um, organic. Polymers is plastics. Question two, three, and four could include polymers, which is no longer part of your syllabus. And question 10 used to be fertilizers. Okay, so what to expect from your chemistry paper? It is a three hour exam with 150 marks and it's 20 marks of multiple choice. There are 10 multiple choice questions, multiple choice questions, and they make up question one. You answer with A, B, C, or D, and then it's 130 marks of structured questions. Question one, like I said, is multiple choice questions. There are two marks each, and they are 1.1 to 1.10. Question two, are three, four, five, etc., up until nine, are longest questions, and they have levels. They have level one, two, three, and four. Level one are your definitions. Level two are your calculations. Level three are more complex calculations. And level four are typically unseen questions. They say you must use the numbering as it is numbered in the question paper. That is quite important so that the markers who are complete strangers to you and they don't know who you are as people will know exactly which question you're answering because you have numbered it exactly how it is in the question paper. Okay, so here's just a run through of your questions. Question one will always be multiple choice. Question two is organic naming with an IUPAC system. Question three is the physical properties, which is normally the vapor pressure and the boiling point, typically. Question four is organic reactions. Question five is reaction rates. Question six is at chemical equilibrium with the rice seed table. Question seven is acids and bases and pH calculations. Question eight is galvanic cells, which are the spontaneous ones. And question nine is intellectualistic cells. If you happen to do past papers, 
You can also get question 10, which is fertilizers. But for us, we do not do fertilizers anymore. And we also do not do polymers. We don't do the plastics, which is polyethane, polyethene. Um, we don't do those. So you must check in your question 2 to 4 that you don't worry about anything to do with polymers. And we don't do question 10 anymore. I'm just going to run through your formula sheets now. You need to make best friends with your formula sheets because they actually secretly help you with quite a few things. Um, for example, pressure, the standard pressure. This, if you are asked for the standard conditions of the galvanic cell, and the galvanic cell involves a gas, you can quote this as being the standard pressure for the conditions required for a galvanic cell. You're supposed to learn it, but it's actually also given to you on the formula sheet. Molar gas volume at STP. This is given for the stoichiometry formula. This one is for N equals V over Vm. And this helps you to remember that volume must be measured in decimeters cubed. Standard temperature is 273 Kelvin. That's maybe a bit confusing because the standard temperature for the galvanic cell is actually 298, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So the standard temperature doesn't really help you remember anything. The charge of an electron is given, and Avogadro's constant, which is the number of molecules in a mole, or the number of units in a mole. So if ever you get confused by any of these formulae, you must just go look on your formula sheet to see which ones are the constants? So I can highlight them for you here quickly. This one is a constant and this one is a constant. So you don't have to worry about knowing what those numbers are. They are given on your formula sheet. I would suggest what you do before you study is you write out what each of these symbols mean and the unit that they are measured in. So you can always... Whenever you look at your formula sheet, you can see the notes that you've made. And so when you look at your formula sheet, when you get to the exam, you will see the notes that you made on the one that you used to study. And so you will remember, without even trying, the units and what the symbols mean. So it will help you when you do your stoichiometry. So these ones here are all used for stoichiometry. This one here is only used for acids and bases with titrations that work to completion. This is your pH formula, which is also acids and bases. It's question seven. And this here is used when you want to convert information that you were given about an acid into information about a base. The, this formula is typically used for when you want to do a pH calculation of a base. And here, is the standard temperature, which you can actually use to answer the galvanic standard conditions question. These formulae here are used for the galvanic cell, and these ones are actually incredibly useful because they tell you that the cathode is where reduction happens and the oxidizing agent gets reduced at the cathode. They also tell you that the anode is where oxidation happens and the reducing agent is the thing that gets oxidized at the anode. You can write any one of these formulae if you're using them in your question eight for galvanic, but these formulae actually tell you stuff that you're supposed to learn. So you don't actually have to learn it, you just have to understand where to find it on your formula sheet, which is given to you in the exam. This is obviously the periodic table, which you know and love by now. And the molar mass is given for each of the elements in grams per mole. So this one, this relative atomic mass is similar to the molar mass, which is measured in grams per mole. And the atomic number is the number of protons or the number of electrons in the neutral atom. Um, this should have been known in grade 10 and it will be given to you in your exam. It's normally the very last um, formula sheet given. Here we have table 4a and table 4b. I'm just going to draw a line. Well, there is already a line here. We do not worry about table 4a. We learn according to table 4b. 
and this is the one that was used in your video for question 8 and question 9. We need to look at this table, table 4b. So what you can do, one of the very first things you can do when you're allowed to touch a pen, is just completely cross out table 4a. If you note, in table 4b, lithium is at the top, table 4a, lithium is actually at the bottom. These two tables are actually basically just the inverse of each other. So everything that you learn for table 4b, top right, bottom left, oxidizing agents, reducing agents, it's all the other way around on table 4a. So if you mix up these two tables, you are going to be getting everything wrong. So somewhere in Shakespeare, they ask to be or not to be. What you need to do is to be plus 2b. You need to look at 4b. Okay, so how to prepare for an exam. What we need to do is we need to use the exam guidelines, which are freely available on the internet, or your teacher would have given them to you, because they will tell you exactly what is allowed to be examined. And you need to study the definitions given in the exam guidelines, because the definitions make up all the level one questions. They are typically found, so a question, for example, 2.1, 3.1, 4.1, 5.1, all of those will typically be definitions. And I think we should maybe go through our paper first thing and just write down all the definitions, because that is stuff that you are simply required to remember. Go through your examples in your workbook and your textbook and work through past exam papers. Here is the link that you can get past exam papers with memos I think that this is the best that you can possibly do to prepare for your exams. Go through 10 exam papers with memos and you will feel a lot better about what's coming. You'll be familiar with the content and familiar with the way that they ask things. The 10 minutes of reading time that you're given before you start writing, I would suggest you go and look at the nice questions. Look for the ones that you remember, look for the ones that you are comfortable with and answer those questions first. You get given a booklet of paper, so what you can do is page one, question one, page two, question two, page three, question three, and so on. You can label each of your pages according to the question, and if you happen to go over a page with any of your questions, you can just make a note and say, look at the back for the rest of question five, for example. So what we could do then is go through each of the questions and just answer the easier ones. Typically, 2.1 will be easier than 2.2, which should be easier than 2.3. So ideally, we could go through and answer 2.1, 2.2, 3.1, 3.2, 4.1, 4.3, 5.1, 6.1, 7.1, 8.1, 9.1, 10.1, 11.1, 12.1, 13.1, 14.1, 15.1, 16.1, 17.1, 18.1, 19.1, 20.1, 21.1, 22.1, 23.1, 24.1, 25.1, 26.1, 27.1, 28.1, 29.1, 30.1, 31.1, 32.1, 33.1, 34.1, 35.1, 36.1, 37.1, 38.1, 39.1, 40.1, 41.1, 42.1, 43.1, 44.1, 45.1, 46.1, 47.1, 48.1, 49.1, 50.1, 51.1, 52.1, 53.1, 54.1, 55.1, 56.1, 57.1, 58.1, 59.1, 60.1, 61.1, 62.1, 63.1, 64.1, 65.1, 66.1, 67.1, 68.1, 69.1, 70.1, 71.1, 72.1, 73.1, 74.1, 75.1, 76.1, 77.1, 78.1, 79.1, 80.1, 81.1, 82.1, 83.1, 84.1, 85.1, 86.1, 87.1, 88.1, 89.1, 90.1, 91.1, 92.1, 93.1, 94.1, 95.1, 96.1, 97.1, 98.1, 99.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 100.1, 
and make sure that it follows logically what you actually meant to say. You must write all of your steps in your calculations and you must label number of moles initial, number of moles final, number of moles of HCl, number of moles of NaOH. You must try and be as clear as you can because the people marking your work do not know you. They don't know how you think or what struggles you have or what you mean or they don't understand your handwriting. They've never marked your work before. So you need to be kind to your marker. So here's what I was saying about labeling your things. So you must label that you are now working out the mass of sodium hydroxide. So you don't end up with three or four random little masses. I don't know what you're talking about if I'm gonna try and mark your stuff. So you must try and be kind to me and just label what it is that you're doing so that it is easier for me to mark. Remember your units. Everything has a unit except for Kc and actually pH. pH also doesn't have a unit. And please bring your calculator with to the exam. Or, if you don't have a calculator, get one. Go and borrow one from a grade 8 or borrow one from a teacher. Just make sure that you have a calculator because you don't want to lose marks just because you forgot your calculator because you left it on your desk before you came to school to write the exam. Okay, so just another list of things you need to be able to do. You need to know what a homologous series is, what a functional group is. You need to know those definitions. You need to know the difference between saturated and unsaturated. You need to know the isomers and what type they are, whether they are functional isomers, chain isomers, or positional isomers. And you need to know how to draw and name the functional groups of compounds. You need to know the general formulae of the compounds. This is all for organic, for question 2, 3, and 4. You need to know all of your definitions. You can look in the 2021 exam guidelines to find the exact words that you need for each of your definitions. You need to be able to use the IUPAC system for naming of organic compounds. And you need to remember to separate your numbers with commas and separate your numbers from your words with dashes. So it's 2,4-dimethylhexane, for example. It is a comma that separates numbers, and it is a dash that separates numbers and words. So numbers are separated by commas, and words and numbers are separated by dashes. So then, as long as you can get the correct format for naming, that's some guaranteed marks. And when you want to talk about your chemical formulae, you need to remember your little numbers, your small numbers. We don't write H2O or water as H2O, we write it as H2O with a subscript. When asked in question 5 for reaction rate to talk about what is affecting the reaction rate of this specific reaction, you must try and be specific. So you don't just say catalyst or temperature or surface area. You say specifically, in this reaction, the surface area of the reactants was increased and that is why the reaction rate increased. You don't just mention facts in general, you apply your knowledge to the specific question. For Le Chatelier, you must say which reaction is favoured. The forward reaction is favoured or the reverse reaction is favoured. The words that we would prefer you to use is the forward reaction is favoured or the reverse reaction is favoured. And then you explain why. So for example, the forward reaction was favoured because the Kc value increased. Kc value increased, which means the forward reaction was favoured. The forward reaction is endothermic, for example. So that means that the temperature was increased. Because if I increase the temperature, I will favor the endothermic reaction. And if the forward reaction was favored, that means that the forward reaction is endothermic. Read over your questions once you've answered them to make sure that your logic is clear and concise. Concise just means you don't waffle. You don't use 100 words when you could just use five. But your reasoning is clear and logical and you've written it in order as you thought it 
and it is understandable to the marker. Okay, you need to run over your stoichiometry from grades 10 and 11, and they are especially, especially used in questions like question 5, which is the reactions question, and the acids and bases question, which is question 7. You need to remember to copy your formulae exactly from your formula sheet. Please don't make up your own formulas. Please don't get your formulas wrong. And please don't not write them. You get marks for choosing the correct formula from the formula sheet. So please do write the formulas from the formula sheet. Practical work is examinable. So you need to study the preparation of esters prac. And you need to know the theory of a titration, which is an acid-base reaction. And you need to know the theory of the practicals for reactive reactions. When you add a catalyst, when you increase the temperature, when you decrease the temperature, how would you measure the rate with a stopwatch? How else can you measure the rate with a color change? How else can you measure the rate with a change in mass? There's lots of different examples which you will be able to experience if you just go through 10 past papers with memos. You need to know how to interpret graphs. Graphs are very important. So you need to know what the graphs mean and you need to think about what the gradients mean or what the area under the graphs mean like you do in physics. So typically, if you have a graph with time on the x-axis, the gradient is going to be equal to the rate. It's going to be mass per time or concentration per time. Typically, if you have a graph with time on the x-axis, the gradient of that graph will be the rate. So a steep gradient means a fast rate and a horizontal gradient or horizontal line, a zero gradient means that the rate is zero. So you need to be very familiar with graphs and what they mean and you need to understand what the gradients of these graphs mean by using the values given on the x and y axis in the graph. You also need to know about your equilibrium graphs, which is actually covered in the video on question 6, chemical equilibrium. You definitely need to know about table 4b and how it helps you to answer questions for question 8 and question 9. It is also covered in the video supplied by Metro North for question 8 and question 9. Um, you must not even look at table 4a. You've all been taught with table 4b, so please don't even glance at table 4a. Give the first chance that you get, just draw a line through table 4a. You have 180 minutes to write 150 marks in your test. So that is roughly one mark per minute. And then you'll have a little bit of time to just go through everything that you've written to just check that you answered all the questions and that your logic and your reasoning is clear for the marker. So you have 180 minutes, which is three hours to write 150 marks. And so it's roughly, if you think about it, one mark per minute. When you're going over the past exam papers, you will come across questions that use words like name, state and explain. Your mark allocation will also be a indication of how much you need to write in order to answer the question. Name would mean write the name. So if I say name the metal in the electrode, I do not mean that you write AG. AG is not the name. You would have to write silver. So maybe use your highlighter when you go through your exam and highlight these types of words and make sure that you know what they mean. Explain would need more information than state would need. And it should also be evident by the mark allocation. So the mark allocation will give you an idea of what it is you need to write and how much you need to write. And you must just make sure that you understand the instructions given in the question. Again, if you go through enough exam papers, you will be able to do this because you would have seen the type of questions before. Very, very important. This is one of the last points I'm going to make now. You must answer all of the questions in the exam. If you leave it blank, it's definitely zero 
if you write something, it could maybe be a mark. You didn't do 12 years of schooling in order to just leave blank pages in your final exam. You must write something for every question. Don't be silly. Don't write notes to the examiner. Nothing like that. But you must write something for every question. Because a blank is definitely zero. But if you put something on the page, you may or may not get a mark for it. A blank is definitely zero, but if you write something, you may get some marks. You don't need to do the difficult questions. Please do not do the difficult questions. If you're really good at doing galvanic questions, then practice galvanic questions. Do lots and lots and lots of galvanic questions before your exam. Please, grade 12s, if you think that you are very good at galvanic, but you're very bad at equilibrium, you spend all your revision time doing equilibrium, you still don't get equilibrium, and now you forgot to study galvanic. So the one that you used to be really good at, you've forgotten because you were so stressed about the ones that you weren't good at. If you're going to play a sport and you are a really good goalie, don't practice being a striker. Practice being a goalie. You are naturally a good goalie. Practice being an even better goalie. If you are good at galvanic, that means that you can get 100% for the galvanic question. It means you can probably get a very high mark for the electrolytic question too, because those are similar questions, question 8 and question 9. Don't, it's not a waste of time, but don't use all of your time to revise questions that you could find very difficult. Make sure you can perfect your questions that you're good at, and the ones that are really difficult, write something, but don't worry about the more difficult parts of the more difficult questions. Make sure you understand your basics, you are a good goalie, perfect your goalie skills, and don't worry about trying to score goals when your best skills are used to prevent goals being scored. Practice what you are good at. You will feel nice going into the exam, and you'll get full marks for the questions that you enjoy. The questions that you don't enjoy, you can write down any sort of things that you remember. Study your definitions. Get your definition marks. Get your level 1 marks. And perfect the questions that you're already good at. The more difficult questions, you can just write down something and hopefully get some marks. Write out some formulas. Substitute some numbers into the formulas and get some marks. But you must ace the questions that you're already good at. So this is what we're saying with have a positive approach. Good day, great health, and welcome to this lesson on physical sciences for the final push intervention program brought to you by the Metro North Education District. And the final push program is there to help you best understand how to answer the questions so that you are able to gain maximum marks. And in this video, uh, we are going to talk about Question one, my name is Shanae Williams and I'm excited great to, ask, to do this lesson with you. Okay, so the focus areas for question one, uh, we're first going to look at the strategies that are involved or strategies that you can follow for answering the multiple choice questions. Firstly, budget your time great to ask. It's important that you don't spend too much time on question one, your multiple choice section and have to rush through the other questions, so rather skip where you are spending too much time and you can always come back when you have time left at the end of your question paper. Then attempt to, attempt to answer the questions in consecutive order. Uh, like I said now, if you are spending too much time, you can skip and always come back, but you can please just attempt to answer them in consecutive order. Firstly, ignore the answer choices, but Firstly, read the question. Right? So read the question carefully and determine the precise requirement. Determine exactly what it is that the question wants to know and not just jump to the answer choices. Determine the correct answer before reading the answer choices. So that means read your question carefully and then in your mind already determine what it is that you have to look for in the answer choices. The answer choices carefully and then select the best answer okay so with that answer that you had in mind then you can select the answer that best fits with your answer that you had 
Okay, so we are going to start with question one from the May June of 2022 examination. You are given options. You will only write the question number, and next to that you will write the option or your choice of answer. Okay. Which one of the following compounds has the lowest melting point? So grade 12, so you know that, like I said now, you first understand your question before you look at your answer choices. And in this case, this question wants to know about the lowest melting point. And a compound with the lowest melting point, and if we refer to organic chemistry, we know that that is the one that will have the weakest intermolecular force. So that is what we are looking for in our answer options. Firstly, let's look at our options then. We have to choose between hexane, ethane, butane, and octane. So if you look at the suffix there, they are all, they all end in ane, so they are all alkanes, which means they have the same type of intermolecular force, which is London forces, and they, the options only differ by their chain length. Hexane has six carbons, ethane has two, butane has four carbons, and octane has eight carbons. Okay. So if we are looking for the option that has the lowest melting point, right, the one that has the weakest intermolecular force, we are looking for the shortest carbon chain. And like I just said, the shortest one out of the four is the two carbon chain. That leaves our answer to be B, ethane. Okay, then 1.2, when CH2 double bond CH2 is converted to CH3, CH3, the type of reaction is, right? We are looking for the type of reaction. And when we um, change this around, you can see, um, or when we convert it, excuse me, when we go from CH2 to CH3, we need to note the difference. What is the difference in the two compounds here? And I can also see that um, if I had the molecular formula here, this would be two carbons and four hydrogens, and this one is two carbons and six hydrogens okay so maybe let's see if i can go to my visualizer here okay now let's see if we can draw that so we had carbon focus Let's see, page two, okay, then a double bond, C page two. So that is going to change, you see, C two H four, it needs to become C H three, C H three, going to convert to that, the molecular formula is here, Molecular formula C2H6, this is going, what it's going to become. So if we look at this, there's four hydrogens, there are six hydrogens. That means when I add on to this, I need to add two hydrogens to this compound so that it can become that compound to convert it to that. So if I add H2, that means that that carbon that has two hydrogens, one of the double bonds is going to open up. This double bond is going to break and it will allow for two more hydrogens to add on C. Okay. So why do we call this reaction that adds two hydrogen atoms? C Our answer is then D, hydrogenation, because we are adding two hydrogen atoms, right? It's a type of addition reaction, and specifically hydrogenation. Question 1.3, which one of the following compounds in solution will change the color of bromothymol blue? So bromothymol blue is an indicator. It is blue in a base, and it changes to yellow in an acid. So already my question 
tells me that I'm looking for an acidic solution. My acidic solution will change that bromothymol blue indicator. They don't ask you which color, but they want to know which one will make it turn color. Um, so already it's blue, it stays blue in a base, and we need to identify the solution that's going to make it ch um, change to yellow. So we're looking for a, an acidic solution. And if you look at our options, um, here we have CH3, CH2, CHO, that is an aldehyde. Then we have this one, which is a carboxylic acid. Here we have a ketone, and this one is an ester. Okay, so we see we are looking for the acidic solution that leaves us with our only option to be B, which is its count one, two, three, three carbons, which is propanoic acid, which will change bromothymol blue, color from blue to yellow. Then question 1.4, two different samples of impure calcium carbonate of equal masses react with 0.1 mole per cubic decimeter of sulfuric acid. Assume that the impurities do not react. The graph below shows the volume of carbon dioxide produced for each reaction. What is the question? When compared to reaction two, which one of the following statements best explains the curve obtained for reaction one? Okay, so if I can just quickly go back to my visualizer, I want us to, to see the following. Right, so we have calcium carbonate. Here, calcium carbonate, right? That reacts with sulfuric acid, right? And if we know our neutralization reactions, we know that this is going to form calcium sulfate plus carbon dioxide plus water. So these are products. The amount of Calcium carbonate uh, that you have will determine the yield of your product. So here we can see that carbon dioxide is the one that they show on the graph. It is, however, one of your products. And the amount of products um, that you form will depend on the purity of the calcium carbonate that you use. Okay. So now let's go back. Let's just go back to me. Right. So we have to choose the best statement or the statement that best explains what's happening here. We can see the volume of carbon dioxide. The more carbon dioxide is produced in the reaction two and less carbon dioxide is produced in the reaction one, but you can see that at the same time they reach completion. Okay? So Let's, let's see, when compared to reaction two, which one of the following statements best explain the curve obtained for reaction one? What's happening in the reaction one? The temperature is higher in the reaction one. That we will, would have seen uh, by a faster reaction rate. From our knowledge of reaction rate, we know that temperature is one of the factors that affect reaction rate. So this reaction would have just reached completion earlier. The same as with option B, the surface area. If they use, let's say, clumps or lumps of calcium carbonate and then they uh, turn that into a fine powder, it would also have just happen quicker or faster, the rate. Uh, let's see what option C. The amount of impurities is greater in the reaction two, or D, the amount of impurities is greater in the reaction one. So, impurities already told us that both samples are impure, but from this, from the options, it tells us that one has more uh, impurities than the other. One sample has more impurities than the other. And that is how we will distinguish between reaction one or two, one or two, because the more impurities there is in a certain compound, the less products they will be yielded. Okay, so here you can see in the reaction two, I produced more carbon dioxide, therefore there has to be less impurities. In the reaction one, they are there is less um, carbon dioxide produced, so there had to be more impurities. So if we look, we are going to go with the answer D. The amount of impurities is greater in the reaction one. Right, that is question 1.5. The equation below represents a hypothetical reaction. A gas plus B gas reversible reaction forms C 
gas and delta H is negative 50 kilojoules per mole. The activation energy for the reverse reaction is 110 kilojoules per mole. Which one of the following is the activation energy in kilojoules per mole for the forward reaction? So let's go back to our visualizer. You don't want to do the following here. Way and something like that. Excuse me. Okay. Okay. So we said we have a delta H that is delta H that is negative fifty kilojoules. Oh, right, and that negative tells us that this reaction is exothermic. And exothermic means that we already should know the shape of this graph. If I draw two axes, we have a reactants, we have our products that will form our shape of our graph. Okay, so they said they said you just know that is the reactant the product, sorry, and this one is the reactants. They said the delta H delta H is 50. So that is how much energy it over here. Delta H is 50 minus 50 kilojoules. Then they also said that the activation energy, which is the minimum energy required to activate it to start this reaction before the reverse. So going from this side over and down to the products, that is your forward reaction. If we start over here at the back and we go back, that is our reverse reaction. So the reverse reaction get into the activated complex over here. So this amount of energy was 110 kilojoules. Wow. Okay. So they want to know what is the activation energy for the Forward reaction. Forward reaction is also to get to the activated complex. So from there to there, how much will that be? Okay. So if this much, and sorry, it's not according to scale. This is just a sketch graph. Um, from the products up to the activated complex, that is 110. If this much is 50, how much will that be? Simple calculation minus 50 gives us 60. Okay, and that is a curve for, for this reaction or this question over here that leaves us with option B. 60 kilojoules per mole is the activation energy for the forward reaction. Now we move on to question 1.6. A reaction reaches equilibrium at 25 degrees Celsius in a flask according to the following balance equation. So we have uh, CO H2O 2 plus or 6 2 plus plus 4 chloride, chloride ions in reversible reaction CO CO 4 2 minus plus 6 H2O and delta H is greater than 0. Greater than 0 means that it is endothermic, right? It is a positive number. Which one of the following will change the color of the mixture from pink to blue? So again, grade 12, without looking at our answer options or answer choices, let's first understand what is happening here. On my reactant side, the solution is pink. On my product side, the solution is blue. And I need to see which one is going to change my reaction from pink to blue and you can see the in which direction the cursor is moving is going from pink to blue so it's going to the right which which means that the question is just asking you what change will favor the forward reaction so this grade 12 so you have to link to um, your notes on chemical equilibrium and especially Le Chatelier's principle that states that when the equilibrium in a closed or isolated system is disturbed, the system will reinstate a new equilibrium by favoring the reaction that opposes that change or opposes that disturbance. So it wants to do the opposite as to what the disturbance was. So let's see um, 
what our options are now. We are looking for the reaction that will favor the forward reaction. If I add water, right, water's formula is H2O, and if I look at my balance equation, H2O is over here. If I add more water, the system will try to um, counter that trend by removing or using more of that water. So using more water means that I will favor the reverse reaction, which goes from blue to pink, but that is not the change that we want. That change favors the reverse reaction. That is not the one we are looking for. Option B then, cooling down the flask. You can see cooling and heating has to do with a temperature change. And therefore we look at this delta H is greater than zero. Uh, delta H greater than zero, like I said, is positive, which is, means it's endothermic. And endothermic um, is cools down. So if it cools, if they cool down the flask, um, the system will want to heat up or warm up that flask again. Forward is endothermic, which cools down, and reverse, the reverse reaction is in the one that's going to heat it up. So if the heating up reaction is favored by the reverse reaction, it's going to change from blue to pink, and that's also not the one that we want. We want to look for the reaction that's going to favor the forward reaction. Adding sodium hydroxide. Sodium hydroxide, if you look at all of your reactors and products, uh, they do not even have a carbon ion there. There's no sodium ions. There's no hydroxide ions. So adding that won't affect or won't change um, the reaction from pink to blue. And then lastly, adding NH4Cl. NH4Cl consists of an ammonium ion and a chloride ion. And if you look at our balance equation here, you can see that here we have chloride ions. So if I add more chloride ions, I am increasing this concentration, which means the system will want to use more of this. Using more of that means that this number decreases while we are making more products, which means that the forward reaction gets favored and the reaction solution changes from pink to blue. Therefore, our answer is option D. Question 1.7, dilute nitric acid is added to distilled water at 25 degrees Celsius. How will this affect the hydronium ion concentration, H3O+, and the ionization constant, Kw, of water at 25 degrees Celsius? Now, let's see. Nitric acid, K12, we should know, is one of our strong acids. Strong acids ionize completely in water, and that means that they produce a high concentration of hydronium ions. Therefore, we know that the concentration of hydronium ions will increase, but because that temperature stays the same, the ionization constant of water stays constant at this temperature, therefore the Kw remains the same in our answer is option C. Question 1.8, consider the ionization reactions 1 and 2. Um, and let's see what's happening here. We have H2PO4 minus plus H2O, reversible reaction, it forms H3O plus plus X. That same X is a uh, it starts or starts the second reaction with that X compound plus H2O forms H3O plus plus Y. Which one of the following combinations represents the formula of X and Y respectively? So we need to find out what is this X and what can this Y then be? So here grade 12, we, I want to just revert us back to the visualizer. Right, here we go. Let's see what that reaction was. It was H H two P O O minus plus H two O possible three plus plus whatever this is. This compound is called X. Okay, so if we look at what we have, H2O, and you can see on the product side, it became H3O plus. That means it changes by a proton. That means this one received a proton. Where did it receive it from? From H2PO4 minus. So if a proton 
was downloaded there and um, that is what um, the Lowry branch said. The branch said Lowry definition of an acid says it is a proton donor, which means water is the acceptor here, which makes him the base. Therefore, if H2PO4 donated a proton, it has one hydrogen PO4 2 minus. So that, that is our X. And then the same X starts in the next equation for the next reaction HPO4 2 minus plus H2O again forms H3O plus plus something that we call Y. Okay, so HPO4 2 minus plus water. Water becomes a hydronium ion that is a great a proton from this compound, and if this compound donated a proton, it's going to form this conjugate base of CO4 minus. So that is our X, that is our Y, and let's see which option goes with this answer. So, okay, and that was option A. HPO4 2 minus for X and PO4 3 minus for Y. 1.3. An electrochemical cell was set up using a mercury half cell, mercury, mercury 2 plus ion half cell, and another half cell under standard conditions. Which one of the following half cells, when connected to that half cell, will result in the highest cell potential? So the highest cell potential, we remember that formula E naught um, cell is equal to E naught cathode minus E naught anode. And if I look at our options now, we have to look at which op option we are going to choose that's going to give us the greater cell potential. And so we are going to choose between aluminium, zinc 2 plus, cobalt, and the standard hydrogen of cell. Back to our visualizer. Let me just go here. I took the liberty of highlighting those um, compounds for us or those half reactions. You can see here I have the aluminium one, the zinc, cobalt, the hydrogen cell, and right here I have the mercury one. So the mercury one is the half cell that is set up with every of the other four options that we have. And I'm using table. Um, for B grade, so make sure that you know which one you are supposed to be working with for A or for B. But because I'm using for B, it says here it has increasing oxidizing ability. So the one right at the bottom that I highlighted, this one is going to be my cathode. The cathode, okay, and that formula A So cathode. Minus. And also remember, we do not write any abbreviations there. We write the formula completely as it is on our data sheet or our formula sheet. And this E naught cell, you can see that the two of them will be subtracted cathode minus the E naught anode, right? And the greatest difference will be between the values that are the furthest away. So between mercury and aluminium right there. So um, we can always test that. You can go from or between every half reaction. The cathode, because this is the lowest one, will be the cathode in every reaction. Uh, every cell reaction, that's 0 0.85. And then you would subtract it minus, excuse me, so minus. And then you will substitute each of these minus 1.66. So it's minus, right? 0 0.85 minus minus 1.66. And then 0 0.85 minus minus 0 0.76. 0 0.85 minus minus 0 0.28. And 0 0.85 minus 0. Right? So the greater the difference, we are looking for the one that has the greatest difference. And that will be the aluminium one. Uh, you're welcome to test that out grade 12. So let me just see. Yeah. So that leaves us with option A. Our answer is A. 
So the higher cell potential were between the mercury half cell and the aluminium half cell. Moving on to the last question, the following reaction takes place in an electrochemical cell. The dust grid 12 is the decomposition of copper chloride. It forms copper and chloride, uh, or chlorine gas, excuse me. Which one of the following is correct for this cell? It is a galvanic cell. It is a, a power source is needed. A reaction is spontaneous or copper acts as an oxidizing agent. We should know that the decomposition of copper chloride is one of the applications of our electrolytic cell. And the electrolytic cell is the one where a power source is needed. Therefore, our answer is B. And then you're to ask, this is basically how your layout should look. We only write the question number, excuse me, and next to that, only our correct choice. The organic chemistry nomenclature. Right, so firstly, the focus areas is the fall. Firstly, we have a few uh, definitions that we need to know. Molecular formula is a chemical formula that indicates the element and numbers of each of the atoms in a molecule. Right? So molecular formula is also something that we are familiar with from grade 10. For example, C4 showing that there are four carbons, H8, which means there are eight hydrogens, and O. If there's nothing, it means there's one, so there's only one oxygen, right? So this molecular formula, there's something called a structural formula. You just a compound that shows which atoms are attached to which within the molecule. The atoms are represented by the chemical symbols or the chemical formulas. And the lines are used to represent all the bonds that hold the atoms together. For example, this is an example of a structural formula. You can see that this carbon atom is bonded to a hydrogen there, to another hydrogen, to three hydrogens, and it's also bonded to the next carbon. Carbon has a double bond with the, double bond with the oxygen, which is a carbon nile, and another oxygen to another um, hydrogen atom, showing you all the the atoms present and how they are bonded. This is called a structural formula. Then we also get the condensed structural formula. This notation shows the way in which atoms are bonded together in the molecule, but does not show all the bonds. So condensed means to make it smaller. Right? So they take away some of the bonds. It doesn't mean that they are not there, but they are just not shown. So they are basically hidden. For example, uh, a compound like this, CH3 is bonded to a CH2, to a COCH3. So this means contains, they're not showing you every bond um, between each of the atoms, or this is also an example, CH3, CH2, C, double bond O, so this carbon will have that carbon dial, and then the CH3 again, okay? So this is an example of condensed structural formula. Steps to use, it, steps to use when writing the IOPAC name, now you can see it has a straight chain of carbon atoms. There are hydrogen atoms, but there's also a CH3 group uh, for cyprons, which we call a methyl group, that methyl, and there's a bromine atom. So we have methyls and a halogen here. So there are certain steps that we have to follow in this case. So first we determine the homologous series. So this is a haloalkane because of the presence of a halogen. Then count the longest carbon chain, which is also called your parent chain. And yeah, you, if you count it, it has one, two, three, four, five, six uh, carbons in our longest chain, which is our, which it means it's hexane. And then encircle the substituents or the side branches. So it's this H3, that CH3 and the bromine over there. and that bromine as well, right? So they are circled now. There are two methyl groups, and because it's two, we say it's a dimethyl, and it's also bromine uh, becomes bromo. So the same with all of our halogens, chlorine becomes chloro, iodine becomes iodo, etc. Number four, from the side closest, number from the side closest to the first substituent. In this case, it's the same for both sides. So here you can see this is carbon one, that becomes carbon two, there we find our first substituent. If we had to come from the right, one, two, it's also the first substituent on number two. The numbering of the substituents, um, 
the numbering of the substituents that have that has the lowest total value is correct, right? Because, because both of them are on two, right? That is two, and that one is two. Then we choose the one that does, the numbering is going to give you the lowest total value. In other words, if we count from the left hand side, one, two, that means we have a methyl on number two, we have a methyl on number three, and we have that bromo on number five. And we still, when writing an IUPAC name, we write them in alphabetical order. The substituents bromo comes before methyl, but five and two and three are the numbers uh, in all the positions that we find them on. And if we count from the right hand side, one, two, bromo is on two, is a methyl on four and a methyl on five, so they become dimethyl. And if we take those numerical values, right, the numbers, if we add them up from the left hand side, this five plus that two plus that three gives us 10. Right, if we count from the right, Two plus four plus five gives us 11. And the one that giving us the lowest total value is the correct one. So from the left hand side. So that means the correct IUPAC name would be 5 bromo 2.3 or 2,3 dimethyl hexane in this case. So that would be the correct way. 5 bromo 2,3 dimethyl hexane. Let us remember alphabetical order, bromo and methyl, as well as a dash between numbers and letters and a comma between um, numbers. The halogens do not have preference over other substituents when numbering the carbon atoms, so they don't have a preference. We have to check using this um, tool which one will give us the lowest total value. So like I just said, hyphens between numbers and a comma between numbers, uh, hyphens between number and letters, excuse me, and a comma between numbers. The exam guidelines should be used for the correct structural formula of the functional groups. So whenever you are, uh, have to answer a question that asks for the functional groups, um, yeah, we can see the structure of the functional groups, the alkanes, the alkenes, the alkynes, the haloalkanes, the alcohols, aldides, ketones, carboxylic acids, and the acids. So use your examination guidelines, grade 12s, so that you make sure that you are studying the proper preferred structure of the, of the functional groups. Write the full IAPEC name of compounds. So in full, meaning you also show uh, indicate the position of the functional group. So in this case, we have one, two, three, four, five carbon chain, but the functional group, which is this hydroxyl group of the alcohols, is on carbon one. So we say pentan one or and not only pentanol, right? We have to indicate and give its full name the position of the functional group. Draw structural formula. Uh, where carbon atoms have four bonds. All right, so always make sure that each carbon can only make four bonds. Make sure that you don't draw extra bonds because carbon cannot make any more than four bonds. More definitions, a hydrocarbon, very important. How is it defined? It's defined as an organic compound that consists of hydrogen and carbon only. All right, hydrocarbon, hydrogen, and carbon atoms only. Then saturated compounds, are compounds in which there are no multiple bonds between the carbon atoms in the hydrocarbon chain. So you find that longest carbon chain if there are no double bonds in the or multiple bonds, not if, or not no triple bonds. Multiple means double or triple. Um, that means it is saturated. But if they are if the longest carbon chain does contain double bonds or triple bonds, then it is an unsaturated compound, right? It has multiple bonds between carbon atoms. Then a very underestimated um, definition, homologous series is defined as a series of organic compounds that can be described by the same general formula. So a series of organic compounds that have the same general formula. Each homology series has its own general formula. Or we can also define it as an organic compound in which one member differs from the next with a CH2 group. A functional group is defined as a bond or an atom or a group of atoms that determine or determines the physical and chemical properties of a group of organic compounds. So the functional group plays a very important role in how we identify some of these um, compounds.
OK, so now we are going to look at a past paper from the May June 2022 examination. And like we said, this type of uh, or this section is covered in question two. The letters A to H in the table below represent eight organic compounds. Okay? So yeah, you can take your time um, to quickly go through each of these options or through the eight organic compounds and familiarize yourself with them. Two point one, write down the letter. So it's important, grade twelve, that you understand only write the letter, right? That corresponds. You can see it's only one mark. So don't write long paragraphs. We only need one mark. The correct letter uh, represents a compound that is a ketone, right? So for a ketone, you should, if you are given a structural formula, you should know what to look out for for the carbonyl group. Um, for one oxygen, if it's a condensed structural formula, and that the keto or the, um, the suffix, the suffix of the ketone is IOPAC name. So if we look, if we scan through, I can see that a ketone will be E because it ends in own, right? That is a suffix for a ketone, it ends in own. Which one has a general formula C2, sorry, CN? H2N minus 2. So the, the first three um, homologous series, the alkanes, the alkenes, and alkynes, uh, their, homo uh, their general formulas look very much alike. So CNH2N is the alkenes, CNHN plus 2 is the alkanes, CNH2N minus 2 is the alkynes. So which one has, which one is an alkyne? Alkynes have triple bonds or the ending. Ein, the suffix ein. So which one has a general formula? The letter F. Okay. Which one is an isomer of 2-methyl but 2 in 2-methyl, an isomer, great toss. What is an isomer? They have the same uh, molecular formula. So 2-methyl. Two 2-methyl two says that there's a methyl on number 2, but it's still 1 carbon. Methyl is 1. But is 4 carbons. So we are looking for a, another compound which also has five carbons and um, five is pent. So this is pent, that's pute, that's pute. There's more than five carbons, there's four carbons, one, two, three, four carbons. Dimethyl, so that's five, that's seven. Pent and two methyls is seven, one, two, three, four. But this one is not a um, alkene. And so we want an alkene because it's two methyl, because they have the same molecular formula, right? So this one has to be C. 2.1.3 is C. And then 2.1.4, which one has the same molecular formula as ethyl ethanoate? Again, like I just said, same molecular formula implies isomer, right? They have the same molecular formula with different, different structural formulas. So we're looking for the functional isomer of ethyl ethanoate. Ethyl ethanoate is an ester. So which one is a functional isomer of an ester? The carboxylic acids. So which one of our eight organic compounds is a carboxylic acid? And it can only be H, right? You can look at the, the functional group there, C double O H, C O O H, that is the functional group for a carboxylic acid. So our answer is H. Then 2.2, write down the IOPAC name of compound A. Okay, so compound A, if I can just go to our little visualizer here. <clears throat> right, so I took the liberty of drawing this for us and we can see that's carbon, carbon one. Okay, so the first closest, this is one. And then from the side would also be one, but there's one, two. So that should be on carbon number two, three, there's a um, substituent on four, there's a substitu substituent on five. So here we have two bromo, there's also a two methyl. So bromo is on two, there's a methyl on two, there's a methyl on four, there's a methyl on five, right? So our answer has to be 
to Brahma. Remember, Brahma comes before Misa, although it's Tarai Misa, the emphasis is on Misa. To Brahma, to comma four, comma five, Tarai Misa, and the longest carbon chain is six, so that's uh, Hexane. Let's go back, let's just check. Yes, two bromo, two dash bromo, excuse me, two dash bromo, dash two, comma four, comma five, dash trimethylhexane. That is our IUPAC name of compound A. 2.2.2, .2, write down the structural formula of compound F. Compound F is four, comma four, dimethyl. Right, so dimethyl tells you that there are two methyls, four, comma four, which means that both methyls is on carbon number four. Pent tells you that the longest carbon chain is five carbons. Pent two ion means that on carbon two, there is a triple bond. So you would start by laying out your five uh, straight chain carbons for your parent chain, in uh, showing a triple bond in carbon two between two and three. And then on carbon four, you will have two uh, methyl groups. Right? So it would look like this. There's carbon, and then you can see to have this be on two, pent two ion. This is carbon two, so it's numbered one, two, three, four, five. So pent two ion, where there is a, um, what is it, a methyl on carbon one, two, three, four, there is a methyl, and on as well, on four again, there's another methyl, excuse me. So there we can see these, the other methyl. Okay. 2.34 compound D, write down the homologous series to which it belongs. If you look at compound D, CH3, CH2, CH2, CHO. And by the way, that is written. It's a four mile group. It's on the end of that compound is one oxygen. And that is an aldehyde, the homologous series. So remember, homologous series is the group name. Okay. Uh, and it's functional group. The aldehydes have a functional group called a four mile group. So that is this carbon with a double bond to an oxygen um, and another bond to a hydrogen. And in the structural formula of its functional isomers. So you should know that there are only two pairs of functional isomers. The one is carboxylic acids and esters. They are functional isomers and the other is aldehydes and ketones. So if compound you just see compound D is an aldehyde. Its functional isomer will be a um, ketone. And aldehydes, the formal group, are always, always found on the ends of the compound where that uh, core formal group shifts to the middle of the compound to become a ketone. Okay, so then we have this. This double bond with the oxygen was on the end, which made it an aldehyde, and then it shifted to the left, so that is one of the two middle carbons in which makes that now a, a ketone. Okay, And this is now called a carbonyl group. Then for 2.4, for compound G, write down the IOPEC name of a chain isomer. Let's see, G is butane. Chain isomers means that you are rearranging the chain. So it's either a straight chain or a shorter chain with one side branch or one substituent or even shorter straight chain with two um, substituent or more, depending on how long the, the parent chain is. So in this case, if we start with compound G, which is butane, if you change from four carbons to a three carbon chain with one methyl group, then we have methylpropane or more specifically, 2 methyl propane because the methyl would be on the middle or the second carbon. And then from compound G, write down a balance equation using molecular formula for its complete combustion. So all of our um, alkanes are known for the, the combustion reactions. So if we take butane, butane is C4, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 2 is 10. Let's see for H10, if we use its general formula. And combustion means that it reacts with oxygen. So you take your compound, the molecular formula thereof. 
So C4H10, make sure that is the molecular formula. Do not throw structural formulas. They want it as a molecular formula. C4H10 plus O2. So always start with the basic structure of your formula. Combustion means your alkali reacts with oxygen and it always forms carbon dioxide and it always forms water, those two products, right? So C4H10 plus O2 will produce CO2 and H2O. And then afterwards, you balance your equation. In this case is going to be 2 moles of butane plus 30 moles of oxygen that produces 8 moles of carbon dioxide and 10 moles of water. In this video, we will be focusing on question 3, which is organic chemistry, the physical properties. Okay, so for the physical properties, there are some points that we need to focus on which is firstly the definitions, three very, very important definitions that you need to know. Firstly, boiling point, which is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a substance equals its atmospheric pressure. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher its boiling point. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then secondly, we also have the melting point. The melting point is a temperature at which the solid and liquid phases of a substance are at equilibrium. Right? The solid and liquid phases of a substance are at equilibrium at this uh, temperature. And it means that the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the melting point. Because if the intermolecular if the intermolecular forces are very strong, you're going to need a lot more energy and therefore the melting point is going to be higher. Then the vapor pressure uh, is the pressure exerted by a vapor at equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system. The stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the vapor pressure. Okay, so the the first line is a, is a normal, just a definition and then how we are going to inter interpret and apply that definition is written in, in the yellow text. So again, vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by a vapor at equilibrium with its liquid in a closed system. And what it means is that the stronger the intermolecular forces, the lower the vapor pressure is going to be. OK, so grade 12, these definitions you can also get from your examination guidelines. But then for a given example, Explain the relationship between physical properties and what? The strength of the intermolecular forces. What is the relationship? Okay. So here we include the van der Waals forces, which means that, or it refers to the van der Waals forces, which means that hydrogen bonds are stronger than dipole-dipole forces, and dipole-dipole forces are stronger than the induced dipole forces. And uh, induced dipole forces is what we call the London forces. Then also explain it in terms of the type of functional groups, uh, the chain length, and also branched chains. Then when explaining a graph, you have to compare and explain the differences. Here we have an example that says the relationship between boiling point and the number of carbon atoms in a straight chain molecule of aldehydes, alkanes, and primary alcohols is investigated. Curves A, B, and C are obtained. Right, so our graph doesn't tell us which graph belongs to which of those homologous series, but we can figure it out. All of them have either three or four or five, six, seven or eight uh, carbons in a straight chain molecule, and that will affect the boiling points. So on our x-axis, which is where normally where we find our independent variable, uh, the, the variable that we are manipulating, and then on our y-axis, we have our dependent variable, the boiling point me measured in temperature Kelvin. And so what we should know is between the three homologous series that you were given, aldehydes, alkanes, and primary alcohols. Aldehydes, um, what is the type of intermolecular forces? They have dipole-dipole forces. Alkanes have London forces or induced dipole forces. And primary alcohols have the hydrogen bonds, which is a stronger one, or the more predominant one. <clears throat> Aldehydes are strong, have stronger intermolecular forces than the alkanes, but the intermolecular forces are weaker than the intermolecular forces of an alcohol. Therefore, 
because they are right in the middle. Therefore, aldehydes have a higher boiling point than the alkanes, but they have a lower boiling point than the alcohols. The alcohols still have the highest or the strongest intermolecular force, and therefore they, they will have the higher, highest boiling points. Okay. So the graph shows that the boiling points increase as the number of carbon atoms increases. Fully explain the stream. Here you can see as we increase the number of carbon atoms, the boiling point also increases on each of those graphs. We need to explain this trend. The trend means a pattern. Explain that pattern. Why is this happening? Okay, so we would say firstly, as we increase the number of carbon atoms, right? That means you are increasing the molecular mass, or you can say you are increasing the molecular size, or you are increasing the chain length or the surface area. When you are doing, when you're increasing the number of carbon atoms, that is the first thing that is changing the size or the mass. Then that also increases the strength of the intermolecular forces because there are now more sites for London forces. Um, to act, right? And then, because the intermolecular forces are stronger, it means that you require more energy to overcome those forces, right? As the force gets stronger, you need to apply um, all the more energy is needed, excuse me, to overcome those forces. Right? So that is just some of the, the focus areas that we need to focus on. And you will see those kind of explanations always have, most of the time, I three three mark allocations so there's certain things that you need to mention and we will use the may june 2022 examination question to to touch on those points again um, it says learners investigate factors that influence the boiling points of organic compounds the boiling points of some organic compounds obtained are shown in the table below here we have six uh, organic compounds, propane, butane, pentane, methyl butane, ethanol, and ethanol. Right? It shows all the size. It also shows us the boiling point in degrees Celsius. 3.1. Define the term boiling point. Now, great class, we just did this. It's very important that for this definition, study it exactly like it is on your examination guidelines. And that answer was that it's the temperature at which the vapor pressure of a substance equals the atmospheric or the external pressure. Okay? Temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So only write that definition for two marks, then 3.2. The boiling points of compounds A, B, and C are obtained. So that means we don't focus on any of the other compounds. We only focus on compound A, B, and C, which is propane, which has three carbons, butane, which has four carbons, and pentane, which has five carbons, right? All of them are alkanes, so they have the same type of intermolecular force. They all have London forces, but they are different by the chain length. So, 3.2.1, how do the boiling points vary from compound A to compound C? Now, great task, remember, because there's more than one compound, it's important that we state that order, right? Compound A to C, <clears throat> so from A, let's look at the boiling point. It was minus 42 degrees Celsius, B, it goes to minus 0 0.5 degrees Celsius, and C, it goes to 36 degrees Celsius. So how does it change? Does it, you, you can only choose from increases, decreases, or remains the same. And obviously we can see from minus 442 to minus 0 0.5 to 36 in Increased, right? So increases, which is the exact word that they want you to do. The boiling point increases because as we go from A to C, and remember, um, I just says explain your answer. They don't tell you again from A to C, right? So you state it again from A to C. What's happening? The 
increase the increase in the molecular mass or there's an increase on the size. You can also look at the molecular mass. It goes from 44 to 58 to 72. Right? So it also increases. So there's an increase in molecular mass or the molecular size or the chain length. We just said now from propane to butane to pentane, there's an increase in chain length. Right? Because that happens, it increases the strength of the intermolecular forces and therefore more energy is needed to overcome the intermolecular force. And you can see that is your three marks. Make sure that you have three points to get those three marks. Then question 3.3, the boiling points of compounds B, C and D are compared. Is this a fair comparison? Choose from yes or no and give a reason for the answer. So we only look at compound B, which is butane, compound C, which is pentane, and D, which is methyl butane, or you can say two methyl butane. Right. So pentane and methyl butane, you can see they have the same molecular mass because they are isomers, chain isomers of each other, but they are they have different chain lengths, right? This one is branched, that one is a straight five carbon chain. Is it fair to compare a straight four carbon chain, a straight five carbon chain to a four carbon with a side branch? The answer is definitely no. It's not fair because, like we just said, there is more than one independent variable, right? It's both the molecular mass that is changing and the chain length are changing the surface areas, right? So, between butane and methyl butane, that would be a fair comparison because um, here we are. Um, let me see. Excuse me. Butane and pentane or is a fair comparison. They both are straight chain, but they are um, only changing the independent variable, which is the chain length. Right? Pentane and methyl butane would also be fair because they also are isomers. They have the same molecular mass but they only differ because of the structure. So the three of those, no, definitely not. <clears throat> right, so you would get one mark for saying no and one mark for the correct reason. Then question 3.4, the boiling points of compounds E and F are compared. So E is ethanol and F is ethanol. If we know our... Theory, we know that ethanol is an alcohol. It has hydrogen bonds. And ethanol is, a, is an aldehyde. It has dipole-dipole forces. State the independent variable for this comparison. What do these two have in common? What are we manipulating between them? They both have two carbons, ethanol and ethanol. So it's not that, but they have different functional groups. Right, one is an alcohol, one is an aldehyde. So they are a different functional groups, or they belong to different homologous series, or they have different type of intermolecular forces, or they are different compounds. Okay, so yes, they have different functional groups, different homologous series, and the type of intermolecular forces, hydrogen versus uh, dipole dipole forces. So 3.4.2, like we said, write down the name of the strongest van der Waals force present compound F, which I said is the dipole dipole forces because they are also London forces present, but dipole dipole forces are much stronger than London forces. And question 3.5, which compound D or E has a high vapor pressure. Give a reason for this answer. So we should know vapor pressure. If we could go back to our definition, it's where um, this, 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 this compound is about to evaporate. So that is always how I try to remember the vapor pressure. How much does this compound want to become um, a gas? Right. So if we compare D, which is methyl butane, it has a boiling point of 28 degrees Celsius. And compound E, ethanol, uh, although it has a smaller molecular mass, it has a much higher boiling point. If you compare the intermolecular forces here as well, methyl butane is an alkane. So there's London forces, ethanol, 
example, has hydrogen bonds. So that also explains the difference in, bo in boiling points. But again, because we know that, that doesn't mean that we are answering the question. The question wants to know which one has the higher vapor pressure. In other words, which one will become a gas first? And our answer is methyl butane because if we look at this, it means that methyl butane will start to boil. It will reach its boiling point at 28 degrees Celsius, and at 28 degrees Celsius, ethanol has not reached its boiling point yet. So ethanol is still a liquid, right? So that means our answer D, methyl butane, right? And because they say which compound D or E, right? You have to say D, right? And then give a reason because it has the lower boiling point, or you can say because it has the weaker intermolecular forces, like we just said, that one has London forces, which are weaker than hydrogen bonds. We are going to discuss question four for paper two, which is organic chemistry reactions. Uh, the focus area, the focus um, points that we want to raise. Firstly, we need to know what oxidation or combustion of our canes means. Uh, combustion or oxidation just means to react with oxygen. We also know that oxygen is always a diatomic molecule. So any alkane can react with oxygen and it will always form carbon dioxide and water as products. So the oxygen, the carbon dioxide and the water will always say the same, but we can use this equation with different alkanes and we just need to know how to balance these equations. Then esterification is a well-known one. Most of us did um, the practical on this on the first term. So we should be familiar with this. Um, this is our acidification reaction in structural formula. Here you can see I have a carboxylic acid, it reacts with an alcohol, and it will form an ester plus water as a byproduct. Again, we can see here we have methanol and ethanoic acid. They will form methyl ethanoate plus water. So we need to be able to draw this or write this in as molecular formula as well as structural formula. Then the addition reactions of alkenes. It's important to note, grade 12, that addition happens or, or occurs when you first have an unsaturated uh, compound because you can't add to something that doesn't have extra space for you to add more atoms to it. So addition reactions goes from um, un, um, unsaturated and they become saturated right so here we have different uh reactions with different types of additional reactions and you can see they all start with an alkane which is unsaturated and the the atom or the molecule that gets added to it determines the name of that additional reaction here we can see alkene plus h2 h2 is a hydrogen molecule it will form an alkane and that reaction is hydrogenation when an alkene reacts with x2 x2 can be any diatomic halogen molecule um, and that will form a haloalkane that is halogenation when the alkene reacts with hx h is hydrogen x again is any halogen atom it will form an, a haloalkane HX that we call hydrohalogenation because it's a hydrogen and a halogen atom. Then an alkene plus water will form an alcohol um, and that reaction we call hydration. Also note that each of these reactions have their own specific uh, reaction conditions that need to be met for this reaction to occur. Then we also have elimination reactions, which goes from a saturated compound to an unsaturated compound because we are taking away some of the atoms from the compound. We are eliminating them. So cracking, firstly, is where a long chain um, alkane turns or breaks up into shorter structures. Mostly um, it will break up into an alkane as well as an alkene that is cracking. Then we have dehydrogenation, and the name says it's all dehydrogen, removing hydrogen. So the alkane becomes an alkene plus hydrogen a molecule, H2. Then dehydrohalogenation is where a hal haloalkane we, it becomes an alkene, and we removed a, a hydrogen as well as a halogen atom. 
and dehydration. We all know what it means to be dehydrated. It means you are lacking water in your, in your body. So dehydration is where alcohol becomes an alkene because of the removal of water. And again, each of them have their own um, reaction conditions. Then we also have substitution reactions, which means exactly that, to substitute, to swap, or to replace. Okay, so um, the two substitution reactions we want to highlight here is halogenation is where an alkane reacts with a halogen and they form a haloalkane plus HX. So this halogen here is diatomic, but one of its atoms attaches to the alkane and become a haloalkane or not attaches, swaps or replaces, and the other one with this hydrogen atom that is halogenation. Then you also get hydrolysis where a hal haloalkane reacts with water to form an alcohol plus HX, where again X is that um, halogen atom, or the haloalkane with sodium hydroxide can also form an, al an alcohol plus NAX, or the other way around. The alcohol can turn into a haloalkane. Now the reaction conditions, the reactions with HX, X can be gl chlorine or bromine with alcohols and they produce haloalkanes. Make sure to know your reaction conditions, grade 12, because stress is enough. Make sure you know how to read flow diagrams. It's very, very important that you know how to read and how to um, interpret the flow diagram. So you can see in our example here, the flow diagram below shows how various organic compounds can be prepared using compound P as starting reagent. So compound P is over here. In the reaction one, compound P turns into compound Q plus C5H12. So that this line is the first reaction. Then going or starting from compound Q, compound Q can undergo bromination and form compound R. Or compound Q can undergo hydrohalogenation and form this compound CH3, CHCl, CH3. And then this compound can undergo hydrolysis and form compound S. Right? So that is how we interpret or how we flow with the flow diagram. So we are going to practice this using the May, June of 2022 examination paper. And it says study the following incomplete equations for organic reactions 1 and 2. Compounds P and Q are organic compounds and T is an inorganic compound. So here we have the first reaction and then we also have a second one. So then our question says for reaction 1. So now we only look at the top one, reaction 1. Write down the type of reaction that takes place. So the type of reaction, let's see what happened to this. And I'm going to use our, uh, my visualizer to just show us the steps here. Okay, here we go. All right, so here we can see I took the liberty of drawing that um, compound in a structural formula. Right, you can see this compound reacted with sodium hydroxide and it formed P, which is the major product. And the major product is a little tip that they give you there. Major implies that there's also a minor product. And this only happens for Markovnikov's rule or for Zaitsev's rule. And um, that means Markovnikov is an additional reaction, but this compound is already saturated. I can't add on to that, right? But we can apply elimination, which is taking away some of these atoms here. It will also form sodium bromide plus T. We, we know T is an inorganic compound, right? It does not contain carbons. Um, so let's see. If we look at this equation and we apply the conservation of matter, the conservation of mass, it means that none of these atoms can just disappear. So if I look at how my compounds change, I can see I have a sodium here and that sodium went there. So this is already used, okay? Then I have a bromine. So where did this bromine and my products come from? It came from here. So this bromine atom here was removed and it was not removed, it was substituted 
or replace get it with z so that was taken out it was substituted um, with um, this sodium hydroxide part so that um, hydroxide um, ion that oh just circle that so we know where the substitution took place okay that oh was replaced with a we are that this is uh, the substitution part and so if this is taken out, the bromine is taken out, put my finger over that. That means there's an open bond here. This carbon isn't bonded to anything there. Um, so what in what Zaitsev's rule? Let me write it here. Zaitsev, Zaitsev's rule. It says that when in an elimination reaction, um, when you have to form a double bond, because I'm going to take this out, I'm going to form a double bond. Will I form a double bond with and also eliminate this hydrogen? Or will I eliminate this hydrogen? And the rule says rather form the double bond in the middle of the compound than on the end. That means I'm also taking this hydrogen out. All right? So that means there's also another hydrogen available on my product side. That means these two bonds, they link up and I form a double bond over there. So my sodium is used, the bromine is used. I have an OH plus another H and these two together should then tell me what T is going to be. Two hydrogens and a, and a oxygen. Okay, so now let's go to our question again. It asked us what was the type of reaction, and we now have identified that as an elimination reaction. So you can only say elimination, or you can be specific and say dehydrohalogenation or dehydrobromination, where you specify the kind of halogen that was used. 4.1.2, write down the IUPAC name of compound P. Okay, so if you look at this compound here, so I have a methyl on this carbon. So if I number from the left, one, two, three, four, that will be two methyl. Uh, four carbons is built to in, right? Two methyl built to in is the name of P. So thus we call the major product with a double four, double bond forms here. If the double bond formed between these two carbons, that would be called the minor product because that was the other option, but not the preferred one. That was two methyl B to E. Question 4.1.3, write down the name or formula of compound T, which we've also identified as water. Um, now for reaction two, write down the two reaction conditions needed. Again, we know that this is an esterification reaction. That is a carboxylic acid plus compound Q will form butyl ethanoate, which is an ester plus H2O. And the reaction conditions um, that we need for an esterification reaction is heat, as well as concentrated sulfuric acid, which acts as a catalyst. Then question 4.1.5. Uh, write down the structural formula of compound Q. Remember, structural formula, not a molecular formula or condensed structural formula. Complete structural formula, compound Q. So if my carboxylic acid consists of two carbons, that is the ethanoate part, the alcohol that is used uh, according to the ester's name is starts with butyl. That tells you there are four carbon atoms in this alcohol, and that means um, it will be butane 1 or, and your hydroxyl group is on the first carbon, so it's 1, 2, 3, 4, butane 1 or, but they don't want the name, they want the structural formula. Then 4.2, the cracking of a long chain hydrocarbon. Remember, cracking means a long chain hydrocarbon is broken up into two smaller parts, which is normally an alkane and an alkene. Uh, this takes place in test tube A, as shown below. Cotton wool soaked in C10H22, that is a long chain hydrocarbon. This is that compound. And there's also aluminium oxide in the in test tube A. Then it says two straight chain organic compounds X and Z are produced 
in test tube A according to the following balance equation. So that long chain hydrocarbon will form two moles of X plus one mole of Z. 4.2.1 say the function of aluminium oxide in test tube A, it acts as a catalyst or lowers the activation energy or increases the rate of the reaction. Therefore, we need to know what the reaction conditions for all these reactions are. Then, the organic compounds X and Z are now passed through bromine water, PR2, uh, at room temperature in test tube B. Only compound X reacts with the bromine water. So if you go back to our little diagram, we can see in this reaction it forms X and Z. X and Z, and they will go through this delivery tube into test tube B. You can see that there are bubbles forming. This is bromine water, and then something is going to happen. Bromine water has a characteristic um, reddish brown color similar to iodine um, and let's see apart from the gas bubbles that another observable change in test tube be again grade 12 observe observable means what are you able to see what can you observe right so if you had to do this reaction that bromine water uh, would start to decolorize decolorize means the color is taken out right so it changes from a brown reddish color to colorless okay so that is what you would see happening write down the type of reaction that takes place in test tube b so um let's see it was addition because it says that the only x reacted and the decolorized the bromine water so that was a, a an addition reaction so uh, the double bond in the alkene that formed right the double bond in the alkene that form reacted with the bromine atoms of the bromine water solution. And that uh, is an addition reaction that takes place. So it goes from an unsaturated um, compound to becoming saturated with the bromine atoms. 4.2.4, write down the molecular formula of compound Z. So this is our equation. We know it as this long chain hydrocarbon that will form two moles of X plus Z. So cracking is where the compound will break up, okay, into an alkane and an alkene. But we start with 10 carbons. So if you split it down the middle, it would be five and five, but it can't be like that because I need to have two more, two moles of X for every one mole of Z. So let's go less than, uh, less than that. Um, if I make X out to be C4, if there's four carbons here, C4, right? But for every mole of X, X has two moles. So if I put a two in front, that is a two moles, four. And if they already said that X is the one that reacts with the bromine water. Therefore, X has to be the L key, right? X is the alkene because it is unsaturated and only the unsaturated com unsaturated the unsaturated um, compound will react with the bromine or will undergo addition. So that is the alkene. And according to the general formula of alkenes, there's always double the number of hydrogen. So if there's four carbons, it's double that. Four times two is eight. Right, so now always keep in mind, balance equation means I can't have more than 10 carbons and more than 22 hydrogens on the product side. So if this is my unsaturated um, alkene, 4 times 2 is 8. If there's 8 carbons, that means 4Z. Um, and I think that was our question. 4, 4 times 2 is 8, but we need to get 10, so they, they are 2 carbons. Left. And if this is an alkene, then Z will be an alkane. Okay, C2. Um, and the general formula for alkanes is Cn, H2n plus 2. So 2 times 2 is 4, plus 2 is 6. Uh, H6. Right. So we can also count here 8 times 2, 16, plus 6 is 
22. So we have 22 and 4 times 2 is 8 plus 2 gives us 10. So that's one option. And we can use that same reasoning to um, give us more options because they don't tell you how many carbons um, it has to have. So if this is um, C2, right? So our key is double. So 2 times 2 is 4. That means to get to 10, you can, you can still have 6 carbons. See, 6. Um, let's see. Uh, yes. So 6 times 2 is 12, plus 2 is 14. Okay, now let's just see if this adds up. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 6 is 10. 2 times 4 is 8. 8 plus 14 is 22. Or our other and last option is C can also be this 4, this 2. It maybe it can even be 3. So 3 times 2 is 6. To get to 10, there can be 4 left over here. And alkene is double. So 3 times 2 is six okay and then four double four eight plus two is ten uh, is that what it's okay so let's just see the two times three is six plus four is ten two times six is twelve plus ten is twenty two so these are our are our options for the alkene and this will be the corresponding alkyne. So any of these would be an option for our answer. Let me just go back there. Right, write down the form of the molecular formula of compound Z. So like I said, those are options, either C2H6 or C14 or C6H14. Then write down the structural formula of compound X. Structural formula, you can see that's any of the ones that I wrote for for um, X, and we know that it's an alkene, so here are our options. Focus areas for question five, reaction rate. Study the following definitions which you were covered, which you covered in grade 11. The heat of the reaction, delta H, right, is the energy absorbed or released in a chemical reaction. Right? So we did this last year in grade 11. And another important definition that we know is an exothermic reaction. It's reactions that release heat energy or that release energy into the environment. And exothermic reactions are also identified by a delta H that is less than zero, right? So exothermic reactions are negative. They have a negative change in enthalpy. In the th endothermic reactions are the reactions that absorb energy. Their delta H is always greater than zero. So delta H for endothermic is always a positive value. That's right? so an exothermic exit. They release energy. They give off energy. Endothermic enter. They absorb energy from the environment. Okay, then you have your activation energy, which is the minimum energy needed for a reaction to take place. So it's Oh, always the minimum. The emphasis is on the minimum um, additional energy needed to take place. Always keep in mind that your reactants, um, the bonds in your reactants also have a certain amount of energy. So your activation energy is that additional amount, uh, the minimum that you need for this re for any reaction to take place. Then um, those re uh, reactants. Before they can turn into products, they need to reach what we call the activated complex. It is an unstable transition state from the reactants to the product. So the bonds in the reactants, they break, um, they, they absorb energy so the bonds can break those atoms and rearrange into the new products. And that interim stage where that rearrangement is happening is what we call the activated complex. You should be able to interpret the following graph. So linking to what uh, the definitions that we just did, you need to know the graph for an exothermic reaction, the energy of the reproducts, you, uh, of the reactants, sorry. You add the activation energy, you reach the activated complex, and then you release a huge amount of energy. Um, yeah, you can see energy released um, between the reactors and the products, the delta H. 
Um, so your products have less energy. That is an exothermic reaction because the energy was released. And then the endothermic reaction is the opposite. You start with a certain amount of energy. You, you, add, you add the activation energy, reach the activated complex, and then these, your products have a certain amount of energy. So, so from where you started in your reactants to where you end in the products, there was a certain amount of energy absorbed, and that shows that it was an endothermic reaction which absorbed heat energy from the environment. And then we also need to know how both of these graphs look with the effect of a catalyst. So a catalyst, it lowers the activation energy, right? Speeds up the reaction by lowering the activation energy. So that minimum amount is now even less when you have the help of a catalyst. Then furthermore, define reaction rate as the change in concentration delta, change in concentration of reactors or products per unit time. And they say per unit time, they don't say per minute or per second, per hour. They say per unit time because it can change depending on the experiment. Okay, it can be any unit of time. Calculate the reaction rate from given data for the reactants. How do we determine the reaction rate when you are given information about the reactants? We say the rate is equal to a negative delta C, which is a change in concentration over delta T, that unit, because concentration is in mole per cubic decimeters and time can be in seconds, then um, this would be our unit. Okay, so this is the, the formula that we use when you want to find the rate of a given reactant. Okay, it's a negative because we know delta means final minus initial and your reactants the concentration of your reactants always decrease when the reaction is taking place because the reactants are turning into products okay so the final amount or the final concentration the concentration of the products will always be be more so this is going to decrease right and if to do not have a negative rate we also add this negative sign into the formula and then the calculation um, for the reaction rate of a product is the same formula, formula without um, that negative sign because for a product, the concentration always increases. You always start the reaction with zero products and the, the concentration of products always increase as the reaction progresses. You can see here for concentration, unit is mole per cubic, per cubic decimeters and in this case, the time unit will be in seconds and that is how we get the formula rate right? is equals to the change in concentration divided by the change in time. But it's not limited to that. Questions may also include the calculations of rate in terms of other variables such as mass. If they ask you to calculate the, um, the rate in terms of mass and they don't give you the concentration, they give you the mass, then it's a change in mass over time. Um, or they give you the volume then is a change of volume over time or if they give you the data in moles then it's the rate is changing moles over time so it's not limited to concentration it can be either one of the four then what factors affect the rate of chemical reactions firstly surface area surface area means are the reactors are they clumps are they lumps are they finely powder are they big chunks and what is the surface area how much surface area do they take up um, then also concentration of solutions as well as pressure for gases because we know um, concentration, uh, the higher the concentration, the faster the reaction rate, surface area as well. If it's a powdered substance, then it will react faster. Temperature, the higher the temperature, the faster the reaction rate. The presence of a catalyst, a catalyst like we said before, speeds up the reaction. So adding a catalyst makes your reaction rate faster, makes the reaction rate increase. Um, and also the nature of the reactant substances because certain substances by nature are just more reactive than others. Then we need to also know the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. And the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve is the curve that shows us how um, the energy of the particles are distributed. And so the probability on our y-axis, the probability of the particle with enough Ke or kinetic energy um, and then the kinetic energy of a particle this is how much kinetic energy it has or how many 
particles have a certain amount of kinetic energy. So this is our activation energy. And before I explain this, you also need to keep in mind, K12, that um, a reaction takes place according to what the collision theory says. The collision theory says that the reactants turn into products or that a, a reaction can take place when the, the particles collide when they collide with sufficient energy and in the correct orientation, okay? So the energy is quite important. They can't just collide. They need to make a big bang. They need to have enough energy. That enough is represented by the activation energy. They need to meet that minimum requirement to be able to partake in this reaction. So the prop proportion of particles with sufficient energy to re react. So if this is your minimum, the particles that have the minimum or more, they have sufficient amount of energy, they can um, form a, a fruitful collision or an effective collision. This is the amount represented with the, the green lines over here. But what happens if you increase the temperature? So this graph is at a certain temperature. Okay, Then you have a certain amount of particles that have enough energy to take part in the reaction. If you have a lower temperature and you have the same activation energy. If you can look through this, uh, through the red lines under where the graph would, would um, be under the green line, this part here that I'm showing on my cursor, that is how many particles have enough energy to participate in the reaction when the temperature is lower. You see, a lower temperature, then only this little amount of particles have sufficient energy. And at a higher temperature, there is a lot more particles that have sufficient energy to react. So if there's more particles that are able to react, you can increase the rate of the reaction. And the same thing we can see with a catalyst uh, and what it does to the activation energy. If this is your activation energy, right, your Maxwell distribution curve shows that only this portion of particles have enough energy. But if you add a catalyst, you are lowering the activation energy. So now more particles have enough energy to partake or to react in this situation, in this reaction. Okay. Now let us revise this question with the May June 2022 exam, exam paper. And it says learners use the reaction of magnesium carbonate with excess dilute hydrochloric acid. So the fact that they say dilute hydrochloric acid is in excess, it means that the magnesium carbonate is your limiting reactant, right? We need to know that to investigate the relationship between temperature and the rate of chemical reaction. So we are using magnesium carbonate and dilute hydrochloric acid to see what effect will that um will have changing the temperature I have on the rate of the reaction. The balance equation is given. Magnesium carbonate plus two moles of hydrochloric acid plus magnesium chloride plus carbon dioxide plus water. The results obtained are represented in the graph below. This is a, this is a graph of average rate of production of carbon dioxide in grams per minute, right? So grams is the mass, minute is the time. So that grid house should give you a little hint or give you a clue as to how you can calculate the rate. Because remember, we see the rate is not only changing temperature over time, but can also be changed in mass over time. And here our time is in minutes, right? Versus temperature. Average rate of production of carbon dioxide. We see that carbon dioxide is one of our products there. And here you can see the rate of the production, how quickly carbon dioxide gets produced increases as the temperature increases, right? Five point one. Now let's go to the questions. Excuse me. Yes. Five point one. Define the term rate of reaction. Put two marks. It's only the definition and recalls again, make sure that you know the definitions exactly like they are from the examination guidelines, right? It is the change in concentration of products or reactants per unit time. So change in concentration, which is that um, numerator of your fraction, and then per unit time, which is the denominator 
of your of your fraction for that um for that formula okay per unit time is important and then 5.2 state two conditions that must be kept constant during this investigation so let's see again we want to investigate temperature so um, we know that the factors that affect the rate is temperature, is surface area, is concentration. None of these are gases except carbon dioxide. Our reactors are not gases, so we don't apply pressure there. Nature of the substances um, and a catalyst. So they don't include a catalyst here either. In, in other words, what must be kept the same um, as the increase of temperature? It means that the state or the surface area of the magnesium carbonate that they use has to be the same. They can't use lumps of magnesium carbonate as they increase the temperature of the of the solution in the one and in the next time they use powder and in the next time they use granules or flakes. It always has to be the same surface area because they know the, the mass is the same, um, but the state of that of that reactant also needs to say the same and because they're using excess dilute hydrochloric acid they use the same acid and they also have the same concentration okay because changing the concentration will also affect the rate so we need to keep the concentration the same right and then we continue to question to question 5.3 excuse me which says Use the collision theory to explain the relationship shown in the graph. So the collision theory. So let's recap quickly. The collision theory says that for a reaction to take place, the particles need to react as, um, and need to collide. Excuse me, need to collide with sufficient energy in the correct orientation. So as we see um, the temperature increasing on the graph. What does that mean? And I want you to picture these particles as they are being heated. It means they start to move around more and more and more. This means that they now have more kinetic energy, right? At a higher temperature, they have more kinetic energy. Also keep in mind, grade 12, that this question is for four marks. So you need to mention four points. First things first, increase in the temperature means that they have higher kinetic energy. Secondly, if they if you are increasing the temperature, it means that more molecules now have sufficient or enough kinetic energy to be able to produce or formulate an effective collision or a fruitful collision. Okay, uh, higher kinetic energy means that more forces so or more in more particles or more molecules can now partake in this reaction, and more this results in more effective collisions per unit. Time per unit time is really important because you can also have more um, collisions over a longer period of time, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen faster or slower. Okay, and then ultimately, if there's more effective collisions per unit time, we imply it implies that the reaction rate has now increased. Then question five point four: the learners obtain the graph above using five grams of magnesium carbonate with excess hydrochloric acid at 40 degrees Celsius. So if we go to our graph and we go right up with this uh, X, um, this line here, vertical line uh, gives 40 degrees Celsius, how much carbon dioxide was produced or the rate of it was 0 0.5 grams per minute. Grams per minute, that is how much it was at that temperature. Using this information, we have to calculate the time taken for the reaction to run to completion. Right. But first things so before we can calculate that time, remember to get to the rate. The rate is the mass um, divided by the time. Right. So we have the rate. So we first need to calculate what mass was um, produced. Okay, what mass was produced. So you have the mass of magnesium carbonate. And if we refer back to this balance equation and we see that magnesium carbonate, one mole of magnesium carbonate will produce one mole of carbon dioxide. So let's start by our using or calculating the number of moles of magnesium carbonate that we have in that five grams. 
So the number of moles of magnesium carbonate is 5 over the molar mass of magnesium carbonate, which is uh, you see 24 plus 12 plus 16 times 3, which is 84, gives us 0 0.06 moles of magnesium carbonate. So this is how much moles we have here. That number of moles will produce the same amount of moles of carbon dioxide because they are in a one-to-one -one ratio. So that is the number of moles that you have. Now that you know how many moles of um, carbon dioxide will get produced, we can use the number of moles with its molar mass and calculate the mass that will get come, that will be produced. 2.64 grams of carbon dioxide will be produced. Right now we can link that to the rate because what is our rate in terms of grams or in terms of mass? The rate will be changing mass of carbon dioxide over time. Okay, we now have the rate. We said uh, at 40 degrees Celsius. The rate, if you can see where it connects with that graph, was 0 0.5. So that is our rate, 0 0.5. The mass is what we calculated before this. And this we can then use to calculate the time taken to run to completion, because that is when it stops. Okay? And you can see that's six marks. So a lot of steps you can't expect to just do one formula and get all six marks. And then... 5.4.2, calculate the molar gas volume. Now, there's only one formula that allows you to calculate molar gas volume, that is Vm. At 40 degrees, if 1.5 cubic decimeters of carbon dioxide is collected in a syringe. So they give you the volume, right? And you have the number of moles it was produced, right? So they say this number of moles, 0 0.06 moles of carbon dioxide. That is the volume. Calculate the molar gas volume, Vm, for two marks. Let's see. N is equal to V over Vm. Like I said, we have 0 0.06, which is the moles of carbon dioxide. This is the volume of carbon dioxide. We can calculate Vm by just um, manipulating this formula, changing this, the subject making Vm the subject is 1.5 divided by 0 0.06. And then we have the volume of um, the molar gas volume. Again, the unit you can derive from the, the variables that you use. Your volume was in cubic decimeter, decimeters cubed minus 3. And then the we see this is moles per moles. All right. Then 5.5, the graph below represents the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve for carbon dioxide at 40 degrees Celsius. Redraw the graph above in the answer book. Clearly label the curve as A. On the set, same of axis, sketch the curve that will be obtained for the carbon dioxide at 20 degrees Celsius. And so this is the graph at 40. How will it look at 20 degrees Celsius. So this was A. You can see this is what A looked like. If you decrease the the, um, the temperature, then you can see there is a lot less particles who, that partake in the reaction. So here you have a curve that peaks before that curve of A, right, to the left of it, because most of those particles will have less energy because you've lowered the temperature. And then that will also be below um, graph A. So what we are looking at, curve B has a higher peak, right, to the left of curve A, because like you see, we lower the temperature, um, and curve B is below curve A, beyond the peak of curve, curve A, beyond the peak of the curve A. Yes. So, and also importantly, if both graphs are not labeled, you cannot draw your graphs and not label them. You will not get any marks. Be sure to label them so that uh, the, the markers know which graph represents which uh, conditions. The question we're going to do is question six, which is chemical equilibrium. First up is just the definition that you're likely to be asked, reversible reaction. And we know that a reaction is reversible when we see this. When we see this kind of arrow between the reactants and the products, this is what indicates that the reaction is reversible. And the other one that's quite commonly asked is chemical equilibrium. And it's very important that we say that it is the rate of the forward reaction, which is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. 
we can't just say that the forward reaction is equal to the reverse reaction. This is what the graph would look like. Be very careful to notice that the y-axis is rate and the x-axis is time. And you will see that the forward reaction starts from the top. The forward reaction typically has the highest rate in the beginning. And the reverse reaction typically has a rate that starts from zero. We're going to look at more graphs later on. Now, once we have reached equilibrium, once we have the situation where the forward reaction rate is equal to the reverse reaction rate, we can change things in the reaction in order to favor the forward reaction or favor the reverse reaction. And the factors we can influence are the pressure, if there are gases, pressure is only for gases, concentration of reactants or products, you can increase or decrease the reactants or the product concentration and the temperature. You can increase or decrease the pressure. And those factors being influenced will affect whether the forward reaction or the reverse reaction is favored. Temperature is the only one of the three that is going to influence the Kc value. The Kc value, if you remember, it is the concentration of the products divided by the concentration of the reactants. So reactions, typically reactants make products. This indicates that it's a reversible reaction, which further indicates that equilibrium is possible. And temperature is the only factor that will affect the Kc value. Then we say that the reverse reaction is favored if products are being made are being converted into reactants more than reactants are being converted into products. The reverse reaction is favored if products are being converted into reactants more than reactants are getting converted into products. The forward reaction is typically left to right as you look at it. This is the forward reaction. The reverse reaction is right to left. So when I say that the reverse reaction is favored, I mean that products are getting converted to reactants more than reactants are getting converted to products. The reactant concentration is higher than the product concentration. And the other way is a similar thing. If you say that the forward reaction is favored, what you mean is the reactants are being made into products more than the products are being made into reactants. So the reverse reaction is favored means the reaction from right to left is happening more than from left to right and if you talk about the forward reaction being favored the reaction from left to right is happening more than the reaction from right to left okay so now just a quick reminder about the kc and what it means the kc expression has got to do with how much the forward or reverse reaction is happening so basically this reaction here the forward is from left to right, carbon and carbon dioxide are making carbon monoxide and the reverse, the carbon monoxide is converting back into carbon dioxide and carbon. So if we want to talk about the Kc value, the Kc of the forward reaction is product concentration over reactant concentration and the reverse reaction has exactly the same Kc value but the products are over the reactants. So left to right, CO2 is making CO. So CO is the product and CO2 is the reactant. In the reverse reaction, CO is making CO2. So CO2 is the product and CO is the reactant. Carbon is not included in the Kc expression because carbon is a solid. These expressions are made up of concentrations and a solid does not have a concentration. So you only include gases and aqueous solutions in your Kc. You don't include solids and you don't include liquids because they do not have a concentration. So from this, we are able to notice that the Kc of the forward reaction is the inverse of the Kc of the reverse reaction. And this is always true. The Kc of the left to right reaction is equal to one over the Kc of the right to left reaction. 
because of the interchanging products and reactants. So if Kc is more than one, it means that the products of whichever reaction you're talking about are a greater concentration than the reactant concentration. That it mathematically, it means that the concentration of the products is more than the concentration of the reactants. The top number is bigger than the bottom number, which results in Kc being more than one. And the opposite is also true. When Kc is less than one, it means that the top number is smaller than the bottom number. And it's true of the forward or the reverse reaction. So the forward reaction is just left to right as written, and the reverse reaction is right to left as written. So when the Kc value for this reaction is less than one, it means the reverse reaction was favored. If the Kc value for this reaction as written is less than one, the concentration of the product is less than the concentration of the reactants because the reverse reaction was favored and reactants are being made more than products. Okay, this is just a very quick reminder about how you calculate the Kc value. We use the number of moles of, in the beginning, the initial, and the change in moles, and the equilibrium number of moles, and the equilibrium concentration. I'm going to show you how to draw one of these tables later when we work through the question. I would suggest in the top left hand corner, you write the volume of the container, and then this, it's rice E, the R is for ratio, it's the from the balanced equation. The initial moles is how much you had at the beginning, the reactants. The change is how much reacted. And this change row must always be in the exact same ratio as the ratio row. Then you get equilibrium moles. So the initial minus the change, if it's being used up, makes the equilibrium. And the initial plus the change makes the equilibrium if it's being produced. And the equilibrium concentration is simply the number that you have in this row divided by the volume. And you substitute those values into your Kc expression to get your Kc value, which has no units because it is concentration divided by concentration. Okay, now I'm going to start by going through the graphs with you quickly. So step one, what we want to do is just look at the axes of the graph and just take note of the fact that this graph is a graph of reaction rate versus time. So the y-axis is the reaction rate and the x-axis is the time. So it looks similar to the previous one. We have only two lines. The one on top is the forward reaction and the one at the bottom is the reverse reaction. So we have only two lines because this is a rate graph and there's one line that represents the forward reaction and there's one line that represents the reverse reaction. And so what happens is the forward reaction rate starts out at the highest because you typically put reactants in first and the reactants get converted into products. So the forward reaction rate is happening a lot. And then the reverse reaction, once products are made, they get converted back into reactants. And eventually the rate of the forward is equal to the rate of the reverse and you end up at equilibrium. At this point, something was done to the reaction. We either influence the concentration of reactants or products, or we change the temperature, or we change the pressure if the reaction involved gases. And what happened was, what we can see here is the rate of the forward reaction. The rate of the forward reaction increased a lot, and the rate of the reverse reaction only increased a little bit. So what this is saying here, what this indicates is that the forward reaction was favored. The forward reaction was favored because the forward reaction rate shot straight up and the reverse reaction rate increased, but not as much as the forward reaction rate. And so we can't tell from this graph what was done, but something was definitely done to change this equilibrium position. Okay, so immediately this graph is slightly different because this graph has concentration on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. And there are three lines because they show the reaction and they say that there are two reactants and one product. 
So similarly to the previous graph, in the beginning, we can see that the H2 and the I2 concentrations are decreasing because they are reactants. And the HI concentration is increasing because that is a product. If reactants are decreasing and products are increasing, what we are saying is the forward reaction is being favored. So this set of concentration changes, the two reactants decreasing and the product increasing indicates forward reaction being favored. And then we reach equilibrium when the concentrations of the reactants and products are constant. This is what equilibrium looks like on a concentration time graph, not equal, but constant. And then we see something happens over here. And what we can see is the concentration of the I, the concentration of the I2 goes straight up. And that means that what happened on this graph is that the concentration of iodine gas was increased. And what results from the increase in iodine gas? We can see that after this increase, the iodine comes down, the hydrogen gas comes down, and the hydrogen iodide goes up. What does that mean? It means the forward reaction is being favored. Why is the forward reaction being favored? Because I have increased the concentration of one of the reactants, and the reaction has responded by trying to use up what I added. Le Chatelier says that if I induce a stress, the equilibrium will change in order to cancel out that stress. So if I increase the concentration of a reactant, the forward reaction will be favored in order to decrease what I have just done. I want to use up the extra reactant that was added. Okay, and then for this graph, we look again at concentration versus time. We have three substances here, and once again, it's the same reaction. So the hydrogen and the iodine are going downwards, and the hydrogen iodide is going upwards. And they tell us that what they did was they changed the temperature. The temperature was increased in this example. And so what it looks like is, in the beginning, the hydrogen and the iodine are decreasing because the forward reaction is being favored. So initially, the forward reaction is being favored at this point over here, where the two reactants are decreasing in concentration and the product is increasing. Then we increase the temperature, and what happened was the reactants both went up and the product went down. If we see that the reactant concentrations increase and the product concentration decreases, what is happening is the reverse reaction. Is being favored. So in this case what we did was increase the temperature and we favored the reverse reaction. If we are favoring the reverse reaction by increasing the temperature it means the reverse reaction is endothermic. If you increase the temperature and the reaction is favored it means that that reaction is endothermic because increasing the temperature increases the heat and an endothermic reaction has heat as a reactant. You can think about it like that. If you have an endothermic reaction, it absorbs heat, it uses heat as a reactant to make products. And so you can think of it like with the concentration graphs, if you increase the temperature, you are increasing the reactants of an endothermic graph and you are favoring that reaction. An increase in temperature will always favor endothermic. A decrease in temperature will always favor exothermic. Okay, the last factor we need to talk about is pressure. So once again, we've got a concentration versus time graph, but we've just got a different reaction here. We've got a reaction, and if we're gonna talk about pressure, we need to count how many moles of gas are products and how many moles of gas are reactants. So in this case, we can see that there are three plus one moles of reactant gas. These are all gases. And there are two moles of product gas. So what we do in this situation, it tells us that they increase the pressure. They tell us here that they increase the pressure. And when we increase the pressure, 
the two reactant gases go down and the product gas goes up. And when reactants decrease and products increase, that means that the forward reaction is favored. Why is the forward reaction favored? Because the forward reaction makes less moles of gas. If you increase the pressure, you always favor the reaction that makes less moles of gas. Always. If you decrease the pressure, you favor the reaction that makes more moles of gas. And if you increase the pressure, you favor the reaction that makes less moles of gas. And this is how you read these types of graphs for equilibrium. Okay, this is the question that we're gonna go through together now. You can find it in the May, June. It's the supplementary paper. It's the paper that you write if you don't get to write your November finals, but it's in the paper two, May, June, or supplementary exam from 2022. That's where you're gonna find this one, this, these questions. Okay, so question 6.1.1, they ask for the value of Y. Y is the concentration of H2 at the beginning. So initially we had four moles of H2 and the concentration is given as two decimeters cubed. And we know that concentration is equal to number of moles over volume. So the number of moles that we had for H2 initially is four and the volume is two. 4 moles divided by 2 decimeters cubed gives us 2 moles per decimeter cubed. Be careful to keep track of your units and know what goes on with your units. Um, 6.1.2 is a definition. You just need to learn that from your definition list, word for word, preferably. Okay, so now this is an actual graph question. What we need to do is they tell you that at this point here, changes were made to the temperature. And they want to know, did they heat it up or cool it down? So first, we just need to look at the axes. This is a concentration versus time graph. So what happened at time T2 is the hydrogen decreased. This one decreased. It's a reactant. And HI increased. This one increased. If the reactants from left to right decrease and the products increase, what we know is that the forward reaction was favored. The forward reaction in this case was favored. So whatever you did to the temperature, it favored the forward. And what else do we know about the forward reaction? We know from this symbol over here that the forward reaction is exothermic. Delta H is negative, which means the forward reaction is exothermic. So, if the forward reaction is exothermic, we can write it as H2 plus I2 is making 2HI and heat. It's an exothermic reaction. We can consider heat to be like a product. And if we are favoring the forward reaction, what must we do to the heat? We must decrease the heat. If we decrease the heat, Le Chatelier tells us that the reaction will make more heat to cancel out what you've done. So if I change the heat, if I decrease the heat, if I remove heat, it is the equivalent of removing product. And if I remove product, I will favor the forward reaction. So we look at these concentrations in this graph and we see that the product concentration increased and the reactant concentration decreased, which means that the forward reaction was favored. Forward reaction was favored. The forward reaction is exothermic. And how we link these two bits of information together, the graph tells us the concentrations changing tells us that the forward reaction was favored. This little bit of information over here tells us that the forward reaction is exothermic. And I know that if the reaction is favored and the reaction is exothermic, if the exothermic reaction is favored, the temperature must be decreased. So the forward exothermic reaction was favored, which means the temperature must have been decreased. And that's just written here if you want to write it down. The forward reaction was favored, 
a for the forward reaction is exothermic, so that means that the temperature was decreased. Okay, this one is just the definition which we spoke about earlier. Okay, this question requires the Rice E table, and I'm going to show you how to do it. Um, you must. I suggest you put your volume here in the top left hand corner to just remember and then you write your reaction as given in the top two over here so we can just have a column for each reactant and each product in this case there's only one of each the R represents the ratio which is given in the balanced reaction equation so in this case there's two reactants making one product they are both gases so they both get included in this table and then the initial we get from the question they told you that initially you had x moles of NO2 and they don't mention the N2O4 initially at all so then we put a zero in here and then they tell you that at the end you had 0 0.81 moles of N2O4 so at equilibrium you had 0 0.81 how do I go from 0 to 0 0.81 I add 0 0.81 the, how I got from 0 N2O4 to 0 0.81 moles of N2O4 is I added 0 0.81. And in order to make 0 0.81, I must have used up 1.62 of the NO2 because the ratio of the change column must be the same as the ratio column, row. So two of these make one of these, two of these were used up to make one of these, which means that the equilibrium number of moles that I have is X minus 1,62, and the number of moles of N2O4 that I have at equilibrium is 0 0.81. Then how do I get from the mole row into the equilibrium concentration row? All I need to do is divide by volume, which I've noted in my table is 1. So I divide both of those by 1 to work out what the equilibrium concentrations are. And in the KC expression, I put the square brackets to indicate concentration. The concentration of N2O4 is 0 0.81. The concentration of the NO2 is X minus 1,62. And this one is squared because the number in front of the NO2 is 2. So whatever the coefficient is for that product or reactant, it becomes the power in the KC expression. So you have made what they told you would be the answer in any case. It was given. Now for the next part, we need another Rice EE table. They tell us that after that first situation happened, we now have 0 0.79 moles of N2O4 that was added to the mixtures that we had above and then there is a new equilibrium. So once again we start with our rice table, the ratio is still 2 is to 1 but the amount that we have in the beginning is the 0 0.81 that we had at the end of the first session and now we have added 0 0.79 so we have 1.6 and at the end of the previous session, we had this much NO2 at equilibrium. And so now we have that much NO2 in the beginning of our second equilibrium. So this is all the change that we've done. We've added 0 0.79. Then they tell us that the new equilibrium resulted in an increase in NO2. So what was the change? We increased the NO2 by 1.2 moles. Here is the plus 1.2 because we have increased the number of moles of NO2 by 1.2. The change row must match the ratio row. You will get a mark for the change being the same as the ratio. 2 is to 1, so if I make 1.2 of this, I use up 0 0.6 of this. Using up, you show a minus, adding or producing, you use a plus. So I add 1.2 of NO2 and I use up 0 0.6 of N2O4. And I end up with an equilibrium number of moles 
of this for NO2 and an equilibrium number of moles of this for N2O4. Then I divide by the volume, which I've now forgotten to put in here, but you should put the volume in here. The volume is one decimeter cubed. So in order to go from the equilibrium moles to the equilibrium concentration, I just divide by the volume. So you will get a mark in the exam for dividing by volume to work out concentration, and you will get a mark for the ratio being the same as the change. Use the same ratio to in your change row and you will get a mark. So you can get a mark for just having the same ratio and for dividing by the volume. And you can get a mark for working out the equilibrium and just doing the initial plus or minus the change to get the equilibrium. You can get marks in this question for doing what you're supposed to do without even getting the right answer. And then finally, we just take our equilibrium concentrations and we sub them into our Kc value. So this is the equilibrium concentration of NO2, it goes in there. This is the equilibrium concentration of N2O4, it goes in there. This was our previous Kc value. We make them equal to each other. We solve for x and we get 12.42. Here is just a summary of everything I've said. What happens when I change the concentration? which reaction is favored and what happens to Kc for concentration, for gases, for temperature, and if I add a catalyst. That's a summary of everything that I've said here today. If you can understand this table, you can do your Kc question, which is question six. This video is about question seven, which is acids and bases. It's actually quite heavily stoichiometry related. And I'm just going to go through an example and explain some key concepts so that we can help you with your marks for your final exams coming up soon. As usual with chemistry, the level one questions are the definitions. And here we have four such definitions. You can define an acid or a base according to the Arrhenius theory or the Lowry Bronsted. If they ask you to define an acid according to Arrhenius theory, you have to say that acids produce hydrogen ions in an aqueous solution. Hydrogen ions, it's H+, plus. they're also sometimes referred to as a proton. H3O+, plus is basically a hydrogen ion, which is H+, plus, in water. So the H3O+, plus is essentially H2O plus H+. Plus. So it's an hydrogen ion in water. It's called a hydronium ion, this year. So Arrhenius said that an acid produces hydrogen ions or hydronium ions in an aqueous solution, which means when it's dissolved in water, and bases produce hydroxide ions in aqueous solution. Lowry Bronsted has his own definitions for an acid and a base. Um, Lowry Bronsted said that an acid is a proton or an H plus donor and an Base is a proton or H plus acceptor. You need to know all four of these definitions because you could be asked to define acids or bases according to Arrhenius or according to Lowry Bronsted. The next aspect of acids and bases that you're almost certainly going to get asked is the conjugate acids and bases. You need to identify the pairs and label them. So here is a typical example an acid makes a conjugate base. So an acid donates its H plus and forms the conjugate base. Because if you were going backwards, the conjugate base would get an H plus to become the acid. Going left to right, the acid loses an H plus. Going right to left, the conjugate base gets an H plus. The base going left to right accepts an H plus and the conjugate acid going right to left X loses an H plus. So the whole trick of this thing, the, everything that you need to know, you need to link something on the left and something on the right where the only difference between them is an H plus. So an ampholite is something that can act as either an acid or a base. So depending on what it is reacting with, it either gains an extra H plus or loses an H plus. It acts as an acid and donates an H plus, or it acts as a base 
and accept an H+. Plus. So once again, there will be, for example, three different versions of the same thing. So if you had SO4, 2 minus, HSO4, minus, and H2SO4. If all three of these versions were present in a reaction, it means that this one, the middle one, is acting as an amphalite because HSO4 minus loses an H, which is what an acid does. HSO4 acts as an acid and loses an H to become H, um, SO4 2 minus. Or this very same thing, HSO4 gains an H to become H2SO4. So if you are looking for the amphalite, you find something that has three different versions of itself and the only difference between them is an H. Water does the same thing. Water is typically the one that everyone knows. There's OH minus, there's H2O, and there is H3O plus. H2O gains a H plus, acts as a base and becomes H3O plus, or H2O can lose an H plus and become OH minus and act as an acid. There are three different versions of the same substance and the one that's kind of in the middle. H2O, if you take away an H+, plus, you get OH-. Minus. H2O, if you add an H+, plus, you get H3O+. Plus. There's three different versions of the same thing. It means the one in the middle has been acting as an amphalite. That is how we identify amphalites. Find three different versions of the same thing and the only difference between them is an H+. So I'm going to show you some examples now on how to do um, conjugate acids and bases. Just one last little bit of terminology. A monoprotic acid is one with one H+, plus in it. Like, for example, hydrogen chloride. Diprotic is, for example, H2SO4. And triprotic is H3PO4. Tri means three, mono means one, and di means two. So mono means that there is one H plus in the acid, diprotic means there are two H pluses, and triprotic means that there are three H pluses in the acid. Okay, so here are those conjugate acid, acid base pairs that I was talking about, the examples that I'm gonna do with you now quickly. This is number one, and again, your mission, if you choose to accept it, you identify something on the left and something on the right where the only difference between them is an H+. If you look on this side, we have HNO3, which is nitric acid. But even if you didn't know that, you can see that the difference between HNO3 and NO3- minus is an H+. This guy over here, the one on the left, it donated an H+, plus. it gave it away. On the left, it has an H+, plus. on the right, it does not. That means that this is the acid, and on the right-hand side, the one that doesn't have the H+, plus is always going to be the conjugate base. So the acid links with the conjugate base, and the base, the base is basically the other thing, the other reactant, this one must be the base, and on the right-hand side, you can see that the difference between the base and the one on the right is an H+. Plus. The base gained an H+, plus to form H3O+, plus, and so this one here is the conjugate acid. If you go from right to left, the H3O+, plus has lost an H+, plus to form H2O. So you could actually draw these arrows as double arrows. So going from left to right, HNO3 is the acid and H2O is the base. And going from right to left, NO3- minus acts as the conjugate base and accepts an H+. Plus, and H3O+, plus loses an H+, plus to form water. The whole purpose of this is just to link something on the left with something on the right, where the only difference between the two is an H+. Plus. Okay, so example number two, if we can just move this one off. 
example number two you once again look on the left hand side look on the right hand side and look for things that the only difference between them is an h plus so this one over here obviously doesn't have an h plus there's no h plus there at all and this one over here does have on the left hand side you have the fluoride ion and on the right hand side you have hydrogen fluoride the difference between these two is an h plus the fluoride ion gained an H+, plus, which means this acted as a base, making the one on the right-hand side the conjugate acid. So, again, draw this with a double arrow. The base is F-, minus. the conjugate acid is HF. If you have identified the base, the other one is the acid, which means this one here is going to be the conjugate base. And you can see if I link these two, the one is NH4+, plus. it's got four hydrogens, and the other one is NH3, which has only got three hydrogens. Conjugate acid-base pairs, you link the left-hand side with the right-hand side, where the only difference between the two substances is an H+. Plus. Okay, third example, I'm going to go slightly quicker with this one, because we're kind of doing the same thing now, but once again left hand side pick anything hco3 on the right hand side i have h2co3 we can link those two because the only difference between them is an h plus hco3 minus has one hydrogen and h2co3 has two so what has happened is we have gained a hydrogen we've gained an h plus we've gained a proton which means i am a proton acceptor I am acting as a base, which means the one on the right-hand side is the conjugate acid. And the other one is the other one. The one that's not the base is therefore then the acid. And what happens to the acid is it loses an H plus to form the conjugate base. So the acid is linked to the conjugate base and the base is linked to the conjugate acid. Okay, last one quickly. We have on this side... HPO42 minus, and if we link it to the other side, here we have PO43 minus. The difference between these two is an H plus, and the one on the left has lost an H plus, it has donated an H plus. This is an acid, meaning that this is the conjugate base. And if I have identified the acid on the left hand side, the other substance on the left will be the base, making this one the conjugate acid. The only difference between them is an H+. Plus. And if you gain an H+, plus, you are a base. If you lose an H+, plus, you are an acid. And going from right to left, the same rules apply. If I am on the right-hand side and I gain an H+, plus, I am acting as a base, the conjugate base. And if I'm on the right hand side and going from right to left I lose an H plus that means I am acting as the conjugate acid okay acids and bases further have extra definitions and in this case we're going to talk about the strong acids it's loosely based on the Arrhenius definition Arrhenius says that an acid dissociates in water to form H3O plus ions or H plus ions and strong acids they do what acids do and they do it a lot they do it well so the definition of a strong acid is that they ionize completely in solution or you can say in water to form a high concentration of hydronium ions or h3o plus ions or you can even say h plus ions this means if you've watched the video for question six the ka which is basically the equilibrium constant specifically for an acid, is more than one. Why is that? Because the concentration of the products is much higher than the concentration of the reactants. So if we see HCl dissociating in water, and so we add water, it makes H3O plus and Cl minus. The forward reaction is favored, the products concentration 
is much higher than the reactant's concentration and the Ka value is bigger than 1. Examples of strong acids are hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid and nitric acid. Just note hydrochloric is a monoprotic acid, nitric acid is a monoprotic acid and sulfuric acid is a diprotic acid. We then have weak acids. The definition is almost exactly the same, but now it's they ionize incompletely in solution to form a low concentration of H3O+. So their equilibrium constant, the equilibrium constant for acids specifically, is less than 1 because they don't, the forward reaction is not favored. They do not make a large amount of H3O+, when they dissolved in water. And examples are ethanoic acid, or any of the organic acids, really, hydrofluoric acid, and phosphoric acid. Ethanoic acid is a monoprotic acid, believe it or not. This is the only H plus that gets um, donated. Hydrofluoric acid is also monoprotic, and phosphoric acid is triprotic. Then, the other half of the definitions are the base definitions, and they have a similar um, wording. Strong bases dissociate completely in solution to form a high concentration of OH- or hydroxide ions. And they have the same argument for the equilibrium constant for bases. If it is more than one, it is a strong base. It dissociates completely in water to form a high concentration of hydroxide. So for example, um, sodium hydroxide. I don't need to show the water, but it dissociates in water to form Na plus and OH minus. The forward reaction is favored. It forms a high concentration of OH minus. The concentration of the products is much higher than the concentration of the reactants. And so the equilibrium constant for the base is more than one. You have sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide and lithium hydroxide. They are all group one hydroxides. So if you look at group one on the periodic table, the strong bases will be those hydroxides. And the weak ones have a similar definition to the weak acids. They do what the strong bases do, but they do it incompletely. They dissociate incompletely in solution to form a low concentration of OH- ions. The Kb, the equilibrium constant for the base, is less than one because it is a weak base. And examples are ammonium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide, and magnesium hydroxide. You can see that these two here are group 2 hydroxides. These three are all group 1. Group 2 are the weak ones. Group 1 makes a strong base, and group 2 on the periodic table are for weak bases. Okay, even more definitions. We have concentrated acids and bases. Strong and concentrated are unfortunately not the same thing. Concentrated means that there's a large amount of acid or base in proportion to the volume of water. So basically concentrated means there's a small amount of water that's added and dilute means there's a large amount of water that's been added. Strong means that it dissociates in water completely. Concentrated means there hasn't been very much water that was added. Weak means dissociates in water incompletely, and dilute means that there's been a lot of water added. You can be a strong acid, and you can also be diluted. It's two completely different situations. You can be a strong diluted acid, you can be a strong concentrated acid. If you are a weak acid, if you are concentrated, you are still a weak acid. They are two different concepts. Dilute and concentrated is how much water has been added. And strong and weak is how do I behave when I am put into water. Is the forward reaction favored or the reverse reaction? The last one is hydrolysis. It is the reaction of a salt with water. Hydro being water and lysis being broken down. You've known since grade nine that an acid plus a base makes a salt and water, but basically the hydrolysis reaction is when you add a salt to water, what do you make then? 
So the acid-base reaction you've known since grade 9 going this way, but now in grade 12, we try and show you that way as well. And that reaction is called hydrolysis. You might also remember it from your organic reactions. Okay, now we're just going to run through theoretically how you do the stoichiometric calculations. Reaction ratios are incredibly important. You get given a whole lot of information about hydrochloric acid, and then they ask you about NaOH. In order to convert information about the one into information about another one, you need to use the reaction ratio. So in the reaction with HCl and sodium hydroxide, hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, the ratio is one to one. So I could give you the concentration of HCl and then ask you what's happening with the NaOH. The ratio is one to one. So what you do is you take the information that I give you, you label it nicely to keep track. So sometimes you have initial HCl, you have HCl that reacts, you have excess HCl. You label all of the number of moles that you calculate. So you calculate number of moles with the numbers that you are given. You convert it into information about the other substances using the balanced reaction ratio, which in this case is one to one. And you do this for all stoichiometric calculations. You work out number of moles, then you convert the number of moles of the substance that you have into the number of moles of the substance that you want via a ratio. So here, this is what I'm telling you here. Calculate the number of moles and do a mole to mole ratio using the balanced equation. That's why we did balancing in grade 10. Do not round off your answers. You are allowed to round off your answers once per question and that is only for your final, final answer. Please don't round off willy-nilly throughout the question. You're going to lose marks for nonsense. You must round off once per question. One last aspect of the acids and bases is how to select an indicator. There are three that you need to know about. You need to know about methyl orange, which is used when the pH is acidic. It's less than seven. And methyl orange is used when you have a strong acid with a weak base. In acid, methyl orange will be red, and in base, it will be yellow. The other one that you have as an option is strong acid, strong base, and you would use bromothymol blue, which is a pH of neutral. It is yellow in an acid and blue in a base. And then the last option is phenolphthalene, and that is for a weak acid and a strong base. It is colorless in acid and pink in a base. So those are the three indicators that you need to know about. Um, methyl orange for strong acid weak base, bromothymol blue for strong strong, and phenolphthalein for weak acid strong base. This is the formula that you use for pH, and this is the method that you use in order to calculate the concentration of the H3O+. Please remember to write this formula before you derive it into this version. And then one last thing, you convert the base information into H3O plus information by using this formula. So if you are asked for the pH of a base, you use the concentration of the base in this formula to convert the information you were given about the base into information about H3O plus, and then you use the H3O plus in this formula to calculate the pH. Okay, so this is the paper we're going to go through now. Um, just take note that it's May, June 2022. It's the supplementary paper from 2022. That's the paper that we're going to be working through. So here is the first question, 7.1.1. Typically, the first questions are always definitions. So we did this definition already. The lowry bronsted definition of an acid is an acid is a proton or H plus donor. Then 7.1.2, they ask which one is stronger. The stronger acid has a lower pH. So you can give any of these options. That's two marks. One for saying HY because HY has a pH of 0 0.7 and HX has a pH of 2.7. 
lower pH, or you can say it's got a higher H plus or H3O plus concentration, because the lower the pH, the higher the H3O plus concentration. Then the next question is 7.1.3. They now ask for the concentration of hydronium ions. So the hydronium ion, remember, it's this one over here. So they want to know the concentration of hydronium ions compared to the concentration of HX. So it's this one versus this one. The concentration, make sure that you understand, it's this one versus that one. And the Ka value is 1,8 times 10 to the negative 5, which means it's roughly 0, 0,000018. So that means that this value is less than 1. And remember, we spoke about it. If the Ka value is less than 1, it is a weak acid. If it is a weak acid, it dissociates incompletely or partially. It doesn't form a high concentration of H3O+, plus, it forms a low concentration of H3O+. Plus. This is a weak acid because of the Ka value, so it makes a low concentration of H3O+, plus, which means the concentration of hydronium is lower than the concentration of HX. And we just see here, it's lower than, how do you know? Because the Ka value is less than 1, or you say that HX ionizes incompletely, or you say it has a small Ka value, or you say that HX is a weak acid. So all of those, any of those, is the reason for why you say that the concentration of H3O plus is lower than the concentration of HX. Okay, now we have the longer questions. Um, they say that learners add 150 centimeters cubed of a sodium hydroxide solution of unknown concentration. What we need to do, if they don't give us a picture, we need to add a picture and basically, in this case, we have NaOH reacting with HCl. We need to make a little column and see NaOH, what numbers do we have that have to do with NaOH? We have that the volume is 150 centimeters cubed, and you might as well convert that immediately to decimeters cubed, so you divide it by 1,000. Then we have 200 centimeters cubed, or 0, 0,2, decimeters cubed of HCl, we have a volume and we have a concentration. Okay, so we just make little um, columns that collect the numbers for each thing. Then they say that the pH of the final solution is 2. So the pH of the final solution, once they've added these two together, is 2. pH does not have a unit. And the question that they ask is the concentration of H3O plus in the final solution. If you look here, you can see that it's only three marks. So typically, that would be formula substitution answer. Go to your formula sheet, get the formula, substitute the numbers into it. So we know that the pH is 2, and then we solve for H3O plus. And how this works is it's 10 to the power of negative 2. So what they did here on the other side is they showed a variation of that. The concentration of H3O plus is equal to 10 to the power of negative pH. So either way, you get the same answer. You just need to be aware of how logs work. Okay, then they asked the big stoichiometry question, which is for seven marks. So now once again, we just need our little table. So we have NaOH and we have HCl. And we have the volume of NaOH is 0, 0,15 decimeters cubed. That's a volume. And we have the volume of HCl is 0, 0,2 decimeters cubed. Then we have the concentration of HCl, which is um, 0, 0,03. And so we have two numbers for HCl, which means we are able to work out the number of moles of HCl. Volume, I can't do anything with that. But the method that we're going to use for this, we have C and V. C equals N over V. We are going to work out N of HCl. Why are we doing that? Because we can. We're going to take the C value and the V value. It's the volume and the concentration are happening at the same time in the same container with the same substance. 
those two, these two numbers belong to each other. So we can use those two to work out the number of moles. And that's what we do. So we work out the number of moles of HCl. It's this one here. So we do this. But we call it specifically the initial HCl. Before the NaOH was added, we had this many moles of HCl. Our previous question, we worked out a concentration of H3O+. Plus. So HCl is a monoprotic acid. It makes one H+. Plus. If the concentration of H+, plus is 0 0,01, the concentration of HCl will be 0 0,01. So this concentration here goes with this volume. Where the hell did I get this volume from? This volume is the 0, 0,2 of the acid plus the 0, 0,15 of the base. You added those two volumes together. The question told you that the volumes are additive. So in the beginning, we had this much HCl. And at the end, we had this much HCl. The final solution had a pH of 2, which means there was this much HCl in the final solution and there was this much HCl in the beginning. I'm trying to find out about NaOH, so how do I do that? I work out the number of moles of HCl that reacted. It's the difference, it's minus, it's how much I had in the beginning minus how much I had at the end. This is how much HCl reacted. And this, again, is information about HCl. I want information about NaOH. How do I convert HCl information into NaOH information? It's always via the reaction ratio. One mole of NaOH reacts with one mole of HCl, and so that means that 0, 0,0025 moles of HCl will react with 0, 0,0025 of NaOH. This is the number of moles of NaOH that were in the original container. And so I can work out the original concentration of the NaOH by using the number of moles that I just worked out with the original volume of NaOH. So in my little table, I had that the original volume of NaOH was 0, 0,15. And this is how many moles I have. And so this was the concentration of NaOH that I had in the beginning. What we need to do when we are doing stoichiometry questions, this question I think was out of seven marks, we just need to work out number of moles. We had a concentration, we had a volume, what do we do? We work out number of moles. We had a concentration, we had a volume, what do we do? We work out number of moles. This part here gets a bit complicated, but even if you don't do that, you then acknowledge that there's a ratio between NaOH and HCl, you can even get another mark. You can get four or five out of seven by just working out number of moles and acknowledging that there's a ratio between the one that you want and the one that you have. We have HCl, we want NaOH, and the ratio is one to one. Galvanic cells, it falls under electrochemistry. Okay, so first up, just some words. Um, galvanic reactions are spontaneous and exothermic. They are spontaneous, they happen on their own. If you put the chemicals together, the reaction will happen automatically. And exothermic means that the delta H is less than zero and the reaction gives off heat. The definition of a galvanic cell is a cell in which chemical energy is converted to electrical energy. It gets a bit tricky because electrolytic is the opposite of galvanic. But galvanic cells convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Galvanic cells are batteries. Think of them as batteries. They take chemicals and they use a chemical reaction in order to make electrical energy. Galvanic cells have a salt bridge and the function of a salt bridge you need to learn. You can be asked in your exam. They ensure electrical neutrality and they complete the circuit. And there are always two half reactions that happen. You get them off table 4b. When you write a half reaction, you do not write a double arrow. So in this instance here, copper is oxidized to Cu2 plus and two electrons. You do not write the double arrow. So depending on what it is reacting with, anything on table 4b will either get oxidized 
or reduced. They can go both ways, but when you answer the question, you write it with a single arrow to show that you know that in this case, copper is being oxidized. It doesn't have both options. It depends what it is reacting with. And rather than drawing the two tubs and the salt bridge and everything else, we have something called cell notation. The important parts of cell notation, you start with the anode. This is oxidation is happening here. You write one mole per decimeter cubed next to the thing that has a charge. It's next to the uh, substances that are in solution, the aqueous substances. So the Cu2 plus gets one mole per decimeter cubed, the Fe3 plus and the Fe2 plus gets one mole per decimeter cubed. The standard conditions involve a concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. The vertical line indicates a change in phase. So copper is a solid, Cu2 plus is, the, is in solution. So a solid line like this, one single vertical line indicates that this is a different phase to that. The double line indicates a salt bridge. So there's always a salt bridge in the galvanic cell. There's always a salt bridge in the cell notation. It indicates the difference between the anode on the left and the cathode on the right. The cathode on the right is getting reduced. Its oxidation number is getting smaller. It is gaining electrons. Fe3 plus gained one electron to become Fe2 plus. The concentration is there because these two are in solution. And then it indicates a vertical line. One single vertical line indicates a change in phase. So you have these two that are aqueous. And then you have this, which is platinum, which is the electrode. This is an inert electrode. It doesn't react. It doesn't get oxidized. It doesn't get reduced. But it just supplies a solid metal electrode on which Fe3 plus can get reduced to Fe2 plus. The platinum is simply a venue. It's a location. It is a solid metal electrode. In this case, it is the cathode where Fe3 plus can get reduced to Fe2 plus. This reaction couldn't happen without the electrode because we need a place for the electrons to move through. And Fe2 plus and Fe3 plus are in solution, so we cannot conduct electricity into the circuit via a solution. We need a solid metal electrode. Platinum is used because it is largely unreactive. We could also use carbon as an electrode. Carbon is the only non-metal that conducts electricity. So when you have substances that don't have a solid phase or if it is a non-metal, you need to have an electrode added into your cell notation, either platinum or carbon. Platinum being an unreactive metal and carbon being the only non-metal that can conduct electricity. Okay, now we have more definitions. You need to be able to define oxidation reduction in terms of electron transfer. So oxidation is a loss of electrons and reduction is a gain. And you remember it by remembering oil rig. Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain of electrons. So oil rig will help you to remember this definition. That's the definition of oxidation and reduction in terms of electron transfer. You can also define oxidation and reduction in terms of oxidation number, which is basically just the charge. So if something is getting oxidized, its oxidation number will increase. And if something is getting reduced, its oxidation number will decrease. So reduced is a gain in electrons, but reduce in English is derived from the fact that the oxidation number decreases. So if I write things here now quickly, if I say that um, Cu2 plus does, gets two electrons and becomes Cu, if I look at the oxidation number only, so I look here, it was 2 plus, and here it is 0. What has happened to the oxidation number? What has happened to the charge? It's gone from 2 plus to 0. It got smaller. This charge number got smaller, which means Cu2 plus was reduced.
in this case. Again, another example, if I have Mg and it gives off two electrons to make Mg2 plus and two electrons, if I look at the charge number, the charge here is zero and the charge here is two plus. The charge has increased from zero to two plus. It is oxidized. This is oxidation because the charge number increased. This is reduction because the charge number decreased. Okay, extra definitions. An oxidizing agent gets reduced, it gains electrons, and a reducing agent gets oxidized. It loses electrons. The oxidizing agent makes the other thing get oxidized. And if it, the other thing gets oxidized, itself gets reduced. An anode is where oxidation takes place, always. In galvanic cells and electrolytic cells, the anode is always where oxidation takes place, and the cathode is always where reduction takes place. You can remember that with red cat. Red cat makes more sense than ox an, but if you remember red cat, reduction takes place at the cathode. What happens at the other one? At the anode, oxidation takes place. If you remember the one, the other one is automatically just there. You remember that reduction takes place at the cathode, so what takes place at the anode? Oxidation. Um, an electrolyte is a substance in which, the in which the aqueous solution contains ions. So an electrolyte, the definition, is a substance in of which the aqueous solution contains ions or it is a substance that dissolves in water to give a solution that can conduct electricity. And if all of that was too much, I'm going to show you the best way to remember all of it, and you'll find it on your formula sheet. On the formula sheet, there are three formulae that look like this, and what happens is they tell you on the formula sheet that at the cathode, reduction happens. At the cathode, it is the oxidizing agent, and the oxidizing agent gets reduced. The formula sheet tells you that the cathode is where reduction happens, and that the oxidizing agent gets reduced. Everything that I've just told you to remember is given to you on your formula sheet in the exam. And on the other side, if you don't want to remember it, it tells you on your formula sheet that you get given in the exam. The anode is where oxidation occurs, and oxidation happens when it is the reducing agent. The reducing agent gets oxidized, and oxidation occurs at the anode. The reducing agent is found at the anode. This formula tells you everything that you need to know from the previous pages. So this is a very useful thing to remember. Just come and look at your formula sheet, and you will know everything that you need to know. Another aspect to galvanic cells is table 4b, the standard reduction potentials table. It's table 4b. For a galvanic cell, you need to remember it is top right, bottom left. Top right, bottom left. If you have two things and you can find them on the table, top right, bottom left, you know that it is spontaneous and you know that the voltage value is going to be positive because it is a spontaneous reaction and it's part of a galvanic cell. We also need to understand the relative strength of reducing and oxidizing agents, and we do this by using the table. I'm going to show you exactly how to do it. It's a little bit confusing, but I'm going to show you and hopefully it'll get a bit better. There is a recipe in which you can answer any of the questions that have the words relative strength and oxidizing agent or reducing agents. And then one last thing, the, here's an example of what I'm saying. You need to talk about magnesium is a stronger reducing agent than copper, and so magnesium will be able to reduce Cu2 plus to Cu. This question here has a recipe. It has a method that whether or not you understand it, you will be able to answer it. The general rule is we need to argue with things that are on the same side of the table. If you look on table 4b, you will find my Mg and Cu are both on the right-hand side of the table. We cannot say that Mg is a stronger reducing agent than Cu2+, because Mg is on the right-hand side and Cu2 plus is on the left-hand side. 
we argue with things that are on the same side. And then you will see on the arrows on the table, they will tell you whether they are reducing agents or oxidizing agents. So if you say that Mg from the right hand side is a stronger reducing agent by looking at the arrow, then Cu, then this is a reducing agent. So then you say that Mg, the stronger one, will be able to reduce because it is a reducing agent the other side of this one. So copper is on the right hand side, Cu2 plus is on the left hand side. So the recipe, which I'm going to go over again, the rules are we argue with two things from the same side. So we say Mg is a stronger reducing agent because reducing agents are on the right hand side of the table. How do we know that? It is labeled as such. If we look at the table here, the reducing agents are on the right hand side. See here? Reducing agents, right hand side. Oxidizing agents, left hand side. The reducing agents we know get oxidized and the oxidizing agents, oxidizing agents get reduced, reducing agents get oxidized. So we are arguing about magnesium and we are arguing about copper. Oops, this one here. You must be careful to choose the correct one. It's the one with Cu and Cu2+. plus. So we need to argue with the same side of the table. Mg is a stronger reducing agent than Cu. Mg is a stronger reducing agent than Cu. We can see it because it's labeled on the table. Mg is a stronger reducing agent than Cu. And so Mg will be able to reduce, reduce Cu2 plus to Cu. That is exactly what you say every time you do this question. And it is also possible to argue the exact same thing in the opposite direction. So if once again, I just highlight here is the copper and here is the magnesium. If I want to argue the opposite way around, it's the same thing. I want to argue with the stuff on the left hand side. I want to argue using oxidizing agents. Look at the arrow. I say that Cu2 plus is a stronger oxidizing agent than Mg2 plus. We always argue with the same side of the table. Cu2 plus is a stronger oxidizing agent than Mg2 plus. So that means that Cu2 plus will oxidize Mg to Mg2 plus. It is the same argument, just the other way around. And this recipe will help you to be able to argue either way with whenever they ask this question. You argue from the same side of the table using the information given on the table and you always talk about two things on the same side. Cu2 plus is a stronger oxidizing agent than Mg2 plus. So therefore, Cu2 plus will oxidize Mg to Mg2 plus. Here is just a quick summary of everything you need to know about a galvanic cell. You have an electrolyte on either side. You have an electrolyte in either one of these tubs. This is the salt bridge. You have a voltmeter. You have an electrode on the right and an electrode on the left. And in this, the chemical energy is converted to electrical energy. There is a salt bridge always. There is no salt bridge in the electrolytic, but there is a salt bridge in the galvanic. It's a spontaneous redox reaction. It is top right, bottom left on table 4B. It is an exothermic reaction. Heat is given off. The negative electrode is the anode for ox where oxidation occurs, and the positive electrode is the cathode where reduction occurs. And now I need to help you with that quickly. What we do is we draw a quick table like this and we say, okay, this is the anode, this is the cathode. And then we talk about the galvanic cell and we talk about the electrolytic cell. You need to remember what is positive and what is negative in each one of these. And what I would suggest, what I do myself, I remember that the anode is positive in the electrolytic. That is the one thing that I remember. I remember that the anode is positive in the electrolytic. 
I remember just that one. And because I remember just that one, I can derive that if the anode is positive and the electrolytic, this one is negative, this one is positive, and this one is negative. I can remember that the anode in the galvanic is negative, the cathode in the galvanic is positive, the cathode in the electrolytic is negative, and the anode in the electrolytic is positive. By just scribbling this little table, I can get one, two, three, four little bits of information by just knowing one of them. I choose to remember that the anode is positive in the electrolytic cell, and from that I can determine where, which ones are negative and positive in both the galvanic and the electrolytic. So if you can just choose to remember one, the anode in the electrolytic is positive. You can even do it in your head. If the anode in the electrolytic is positive, it means the cathode is negative. If the anode in the electrolytic is positive, it means the anode in the galvanic is negative. This little table will give you four pieces of information if you can just remember one. One last point for the galvanic, the EMF is always positive. The calculation that you do with EMF using those formulae that we spoke about earlier, you must get a positive answer. If you don't get a positive answer, you need to swap your numbers around until it is positive because galvanic answers are always going to be positive. Okay, here's just another diagram of a galvanic cell and I'm just reminding you that the electrons always flow from the anode to the cathode. They always flow from the anode to the cathode, both electrolytic and galvanic, it's always anode to cathode. Oxidation always takes place at the anode, and the half cell contains the stronger reducing agent. Oxidation always takes place at the anode, we remember that by using the formula which are given to us on the formula sheet. Reduction takes place at the cathode, and the cathode contains the stronger oxidizing agent, you remember red cat, the two half cells are joined by a salt bridge. The salt bridge contains an electrolyte. If we want to suggest any sort of electrolyte, we just do any nitrate. Nitrates are always soluble. Nitrate salts are always going to form an electrolyte when dissolved in water. The electrolyte has to contain spectator ions, so you don't use the same metal as in either of the half cells. You don't use the same substances that are in either of the, the half cells. So if you're doing copper and zinc, you don't use copper nitrate and you don't use zinc nitrate. You use any other nitrate. Any other nitrate. It doesn't matter. The two beakers are referred to as half cells and in each one of them a half reaction takes place. And the half reactions can be found on the table 4B. Okay, so this is the question we're going to go through together now. It is the supplementary exam from 2022. It's the May-June exam. It's question 8, which is always the galvanic question. And we are going to go through all of these questions now together. Okay, firstly, they give you some information. They say that it's aluminium is one of the half cells. And X, a gas, is the other half cell. And the initial EMF is 2,89 volts. They want to know for 8.1.1 is a theory question, what are the standard conditions under which this cell operates? There are three of them. However, only two are always applicable. You can always say it's a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius or 298 Kelvin. You remember either one of those. It's basically room temperature. And it's always an electrolyte concentration of one mole per decimeter cubed. If you're gonna start talking about the pressure, there's no problem with that, but it's only applicable if there is a gas involved in this galvanic cell. So in this case, there is a gas, so we are able to state all three of these, and it's for three marks, so you should remember that you would need to state all three. The electrolyte concentration is one mole per decimeter cubed. The temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Please, let's not just write 25 degrees Celsius, one mole per decimeter cubed, and pressure. Let's try and be as specific as possible to guarantee us getting those three marks. Level one fact marks, you should just learn this. Then we have the calculation where we use one of our formulas. So you can use any version of the formula, and you need to copy it exactly from your formula sheet. 
So you can use the one that says reduction oxidation, you can use the one that says cathode and anode, or you can use the one that says oxidizing agent and reducing agent. It doesn't really matter, but just keep in mind that this answer, the E cell, is always going to be a positive answer. This number here must be positive. The oxidation one is normally negative and the reduction one is normally positive, but this one here is definitely positive. So we do this calculation, some maths happens, and we work out that the reduction standard potential is 1.23 volts. If we look on our table 4B, 1.23 volts means that it is MnO2 or it is O2. So now it's impossible to answer. How are we supposed to answer? There's two answers. They told you that it is a gas. MnO2 is not a gas. There are no gases here. How do I know? Because nothing is indicated with a G. Oxygen is a gas. I can see here it says it's a gas. And so I pick this one as my answer. X is O2. They said that gas was X. X must be O2. Cannot be MnO2. Okay, question 8.1.3 asks me to identify the formula of the reducing agent in the cell. How do I know what the reducing agent is? I can look on my formula sheet and I can see that reducing agent is the one that gets oxidized. It's the one that is the anode. For the formula of the reducing agent, what they're asking for is the anode, which is aluminium. You must write formula. You mustn't write aluminium. You must write AL. Then the next question, they ask for the half reaction that takes place at the cathode. You have to write to get the answer for 8.1.4. And then 8.1.5, they ask for the cell notation. The cell notation, you always start with the anode. Anode on the left-hand side, salt bridge, and then cathode. So... The anode is aluminium getting oxidized into Al3+, and then I put the concentration because this thing has a charge. Then I write in the salt bridge, and on the cathode side, I have O2, which is making H+, and H2O. This is a gas, and it's separated with a vertical line because this is AQ. They are different phases. And then this is a liquid, which is a different phase to aqueous. So when there are different phases, you separate them with a vertical line. PT is here because oxygen and H2O are non-metals. And so you need an inert metal cathode. Anode on table 4B is always top right. Top right, aluminium, bottom left is the 1.23 oxygen. It's the 1.23 one, the one that we calculated previously. So top right is the anode, bottom left is the cathode. It's alphabetical. Anode, top right, cathode, bottom left. And so when I get all cathode is at the bottom, this one is the cathode, so I write this reaction from left to right as it is here. Top right, this reaction goes from right to left, bottom left, this reaction goes from left to right. So I simply write that reaction as is from... Okay, then 8.2, they're asking which container, zinc or copper, will be the most suitable to store an aqueous solution of nickel ions, Ni+. And they say refer to the table of standard reduction of potentials to fully explain the answer in terms of relative strengths of reducing agents. These words in this order mean that you need to do the strength argument, the one that I spoke about earlier with you. So now we need to talk about two things that are on the same side. They tell you to talk about reducing, so I need to talk about the right-hand side. They are asking zinc versus nickel or copper versus nickel. Which one am I going to choose? Zinc is over here. Nickel is over here. Top right, bottom left. If I look at my other option, copper is on the bottom right and nickel is on the top left. And from what we know about galvanic, these two, Zn and Ni2+, are going to have a reaction. This is a spontaneous reaction. 
we cannot use zinc because zinc is a stronger reducing agent than nickel, which means that zinc will reduce Ni2 plus into Ni. That's exactly how we write it. Zinc is a stronger reducing agent than Ni. We always argue the same side of the list. Zinc is a stronger reducing agent than nickel. And so zinc will reduce Ni2 plus into nickel. You can argue it from the other side and you can say that copper is a weaker reducing agent than nickel. Copper is a weaker reducing agent than nickel and so it cannot reduce Ni2 plus into Ni. So if you stored Ni2 plus in a zinc container, you would end up with solid nickel forming and the zinc would dissolve. But if you store Ni2 plus in a copper container, no reaction would happen because it's top left, bottom right. So no reaction would happen. And now I just added this question just to do this strength argument just one last time. So in this question, they are talking about magnesium with copper. And the question is, refer to the relative strengths of oxidizing agents or reducing agents. So now they're not telling you which side you have to argue from. You can argue from the right-hand side with the reducing agents or from the left-hand side with the oxidizing agents. To explain why the blue copper 2 sulfate solution becomes colorless. So how do we explain that? We can argue from the right-hand side because what we're talking about is magnesium and copper. So magnesium and copper, we argue with top right magnesium and bottom left copper. And we say that magnesium is a stronger reducing agent than copper. And so magnesium will reduce Cu2 plus into Cu. That's exactly what we say. Mg is a stronger reducing agent than Cu and it will reduce Cu2 plus into Cu. And when copper gets reduced into, Cu2 plus gets reduced into copper, magnesium will get oxidized into Mg2 plus. Magnesium makes copper get reduced and it gets oxidized. That is the one way of arguing. So the reason why the Cu2+, plus, the blue, disappears is because the magnesium is a stronger reducing agent than the copper. And the magnesium reduces Cu2+, plus into Cu. So we see solid copper forming and the Mg ribbon dissolves as well as the color changing. If you want to argue it from the other side, you've got the option of arguing in terms of oxidizing agents. And I'm going to show you it's the same general recipe for how we argue for reducing agents. For oxidizing agents, we say that Cu2+, plus, so now we're talking about the left-hand side, Cu2+, plus is a stronger oxidizing agent than Mg2+. Plus. We argue on the left-hand side, Cu2+, plus is a stronger oxidizing agent than Mg2+, plus. And so Cu2 plus will oxidize Mg into Mg2 plus. So the Mg will dissolve, the Mg will disappear, and you will at the same time form solid copper. The magnesium will get oxidized, the Cu2 plus will get reduced. This is how we argue the relative strength things. When they ask you to use table 4b, we argue from the same side of the table and we say the one is stronger than the other one and so it will oxidize or reduce the opposite side to, to this side. So this one will be oxidized to this one or this one will be reduced to this one. 
Okay, what I've done here is I've made a summary of everything that I just spoke to you about now for the galvanic cell. So all of this information here applies to the galvanic cell. The information in the middle applies to both galvanic and electrolytic. This, these facts are always true. These facts only work when you're doing question eight, the galvanic cell. And these ones on this side are actually for question nine. For the electrolytic cell and then here at the bottom i spoke about that relative strength argument recipe where the stronger one reduces if you're talking about the right hand side or oxidizes if you're talking about the left hand side the opposite side of the weaker one to the weaker one if you rewind and you go and look at what i was saying earlier you will see that this is the generalized argument of every type of relative strength question Question 9 is electrolytic cells. It's very similar to question 8, which is galvanic cells. But hopefully by the end of this, you'll be able to tell the difference. Electrolytic cells are kind of the opposite of galvanic cells in that they are non-spontaneous and endothermic. They absorb heat, which is what endothermic means, and they are non-spontaneous, which means they don't happen, the reactions don't happen on their own. The chemical reactions don't happen on their own. Electrical energy is converted to chemical energy, which again is the opposite of the galvanic. Galvanic is chemical to electrical. Electrolytic is electrical to chemical. We use electricity to force a chemical reaction to happen. When you write your half reactions, as with galvanic, so this is the same, when you write your half reactions, which come off of the table 4B, you do not use the double arrow, you use a single arrow. We are specifically talking about either the oxidation reaction or the reduction reaction, not both. Both are possible, but in a certain situation, you use single arrows to indicate that it is definitely the oxidation reaction that's happening or the reduction reaction, not both of them. Then you must write the charges when you have an ion. So for example, the silver ion is one plus, and the copper 2 plus iron or the Mg2 plus iron, you must remember to specify your charges. And lastly, you must study these three electrical processes and practice writing the half reactions for each of them. I'm going to show you how you can remember how to do this. The first of the three processes is the decomposition of copper 2 chloride. It's copper 2 plus and Cl minus iron. And the reduction half reaction is Cu2 plus plus two electrons makes Cu. You make copper deposits at the cathode. The cathode increases in mass. And the oxidation half reaction, which happens at the anode, it's where the chlorine gas forms. And that is written here. Cl minus, which was in the copper two chloride, gets oxidized into Cl2 gas and with two electrons. The overall equation is this. You can just study it and the overall balanced equation for copper chloride in water is CuCl2 makes Cu solid and Cl2 gas. So if we look on the table, the copper, the copper 2 plus is actually top left and the Cl minus is bottom right. Like previously mentioned, it's the exact opposite of what usually happens in a galvanic. Galvanic is always top right, bottom left. This is electrolytic, and this is in fact top left, bottom right. This is a non-spontaneous reaction. We are forcing the Cu2 plus to get reduced, and we are forcing the Cl minus to get oxidized. This one at the top is the cathode, because reduction is happening, and this one at the bottom is the anode because oxidation is happening. The second process is purification of metals. And again, as an example, we're just gonna use copper. Pure copper is the cathode and the impure copper is the anode. This is the opposite of what happens when we're electroplating. Electro refining, the pure copper is the cathode. Electro refining, the pure copper is the cathode. And if you remember from the galvanic video that, that I did, if you want to remember what is the positive electrode, what is the negative electrode, we just draw a quick table 
galvanic and electrolytic. This is the anode and this is the cathode. I told you then and I'll tell you now again, I choose to remember that the electrolytic anode is positive, which means the electrolytic cathode is negative, the galvanic cathode is positive, and the galvanic anode is, is negative. You remember one of them, and this little table will help you derive all four of them. So here the cathode is negative because electrolytic cathode is negative, and the anode is positive. The impure copper is the anode, the anode is where oxidation happens, and the pure copper is the cathode. And what happens is we end up with um, the anode gets dissolved, it loses mass, as the copper gets oxidized from the anode and forms on the cathode. So the cathode ends up being a pure metal. And we can see here at the bottom, this is the anode sludge. The anode sludge contains metals that are weaker reducing agents than copper, and so they do not get oxidized. In the sludge, these metals don't get oxidized, they just form a solid waste at the bottom called sludge. If we look on the table, copper there I've highlighted in red, but the weaker reducing agents than copper are the ones down here. So for example, platinum, silver, um, gold is normally down here as well. The metals that have a weaker reducing ability than copper, they will be the ones underneath copper and they will be found. Okay, last but not least is electroplating. And here is where the cathode is the object that we want to get electroplated. The anode is pure metal, so it's the opposite of electro-refining. Electro-refining, the pure metal is the cathode, and here you can see that the pure metal is the anode. That's another question that's quite often asked, and in this example we have the anode, which is the pure metal, getting oxidized, and then the A plus ion will go to the cathode where it will form solid AG, and it will plate whatever object is on the cathode side. We need to remember that if we want to plate something that is a non-metal, we need to cover it first with graphite. So for example, if you had a plastic object like a dummy and you wanted to plate it, you would have to coat the dummy in graphite because graphite is carbon and carbon is the only non-metal that conducts electricity. And like we spoke about with the galvanic, the electrolyte must be a soluble salt. And in the case of electrolytic, if we are using silver, we want to have a silver electrolyte. And if you are asked to suggest an electrolyte, just always say a nitrate. Silver nitrate is definitely soluble because all nitrates are soluble. Okay, so here is a summary of an electrolytic cell. You can see there's only one container, unlike the galvanic, and there is no salt bridge here. There is also a power source. We can remember that if we see the word positive and we see the word negative. Positive has a long line, which means the positive side of the battery is the one with the long line. The negative has a short line, which means the short side of the battery is the negative side of the battery. The anode is the positive side of the battery because the anode is positive in the electrolytic cell and the cathode is the negative side of the battery. So in an elect electrolytic cell, electrical energy is converted to chemical energy, which is the opposite of the galvanic. There is no salt bridge it, they are non-spontaneous redox reactions. We force them to happen by using the battery. It's an endothermic reaction. It absorbs heat in order to happen. The positive electrode is the anode, is where oxidation happens, and the negative electrode is the cathode, where reduction happens. The EMF for these cells is always going to be negative because it is a non-spontaneous reaction unlike the galvanic, where it is always positive. 
Okay, so here's the question we're going to go through for this video. It's the supplementary exam from 2022. And question number one is normally a definition. And you can see here, once again, it's a definition. They give you a electrolytic cell and they are using an electrolyte of concentrated NaCl, which is aqueous. This is also known as brine. Salt water is also known as brine. It's a solution of NaCl in water. Okay, the first question is the definition question. Define the term electrolysis. Electrolysis is a chemical process in which the electrical energy is converted to chemical energy. Okay, this is the electrolysis process for a solution of NaCl. It's brine, it's salt in water, sodium chloride in water. And it's actually quite similar to the example that we did previously with copper 2 chloride. This is just with sodium chloride. And there are actually three things involved in this reaction. Here, we would expect Na plus to get reduced and Cl minus to get oxidized. But what actually happens is the water gets reduced. So in this question, they now want to know which one of the electrodes is where oxidation takes place. So if we go back to our table quickly, that for this question, the oxidation is happening where the chlorine gas is getting made. And the chlorine gas is getting made at electrode X. So for 9.2.1, our answer should be X. Now they want to know what is the half reaction that's taking place at electrode Y. X is oxidation. So X is the anode, which means that Y is the cathode. So the half reaction that take place at electrode Y is the one with water. You would expect the sodium ion. So now the last question, direction in which electrons flow in the ele external circuit. Electrons in galvanic and electrolytic always flow from anode to cathode. So in this case it is from X to Y. Electrolytic cells and galvanic cells always have electrons that flow from the anode to the cathode. X to Y is from anode to cathode because we figured out that X is where the chlorine gas is getting made, that's where oxidation is happening, and that is the anode. Electrons always flow anode to cathode. There is sodium, which will be found over here. There is chloride, which is found at the bottom here. And then there's actually also water, which is not normally considered, but water is present because it is NaCl in water. And so what you can see here is what we wanted to have is the chloride to be oxidized and the sodium to be reduced. However, because H2O is actually a stronger oxidizing agent than Na+, this reaction doesn't happen. And instead, we have the chloride being oxidized and H2O being reduced. So what happens in this cell? The cathode produces hydrogen gas and the anode produces chlorine gas. You end up with two different gases being produced. The only way that you can make the sodium get reduced instead is if you use a molten solution of NaCl. There's no water present. It is literally just liquefied sodium chloride. So in this reaction, oxidation is always the one where on the anode. The anode is oxidation. And oxidation is always from right to left. So if we look at all the substances that we have present, we have H2O, we have Na plus in the salt, and we have Cl minus in the salt. The only one of these three substances that can get oxidized is the Cl minus because it's the only one on the right hand side of the table. So then we know if chloride 
is getting oxidized at the anode, water is getting reduced at the cathode. We can just rewrite this reaction from the table, but we must remember to use just a single arrow to be reduced. But the sodium ion is not reduced because water is a stronger oxidizing agent than Na+. And so water gets reduced before the Na plus gets reduced. And so now for the last question, they want to know if what's the balanced equation for the net or overall cell reaction that takes place. So we have the water plus the chloride making chlorine gas, hydrogen gas and two OH minus. In order to do this, all you do is you combine the two reactions that are given on the table. Or you can add the Na plus back. Na plus is a spectator ion and it does not get oxidized or reduced. So we had the one reaction was 2H2O getting reduced with two electrons and making H2 and 2OH. That is the one reaction as written off the table. The other reaction as written off the table is 2Cl minus getting oxidized and making Cl2 and two electrons. So the one re reaction goes the one way and the other reaction goes the other way. This red one is going from left to right on the table and this blue one normally goes from right to left. We write them both in the correct order where the one is getting reduced and gaining two electrons the other one is getting oxidized and losing two electrons. The electrons get cancelled out on both sides and we end up with 2H2O plus 2Cl minus making H2Cl2 and 2OH minus. And then here all we did in the second example is we added Na to the negative ions because Na in this case is a spectator ion and does not get oxidized or reduced. Okay, now this is a bit of a higher order question. This question asks, what happens to the pH of the electrolyte during the reaction? So now this is an acid-base question, which is now in the galvanic, I mean the electrolytic question. The acids and bases are normally in question seven, but now we're asking about pH in question nine. They're, going, they're asking you what happens to the pH in the reaction. If we remember what we just wrote, we wrote that the reactions that are happening in this system are both forming OH minus. These two are reacting and they are forming OH minus or NaOH. OH minus is a hydroxide ion. NaOH has a hydroxide ion. Those are both basic. This is a basic system, and so the pH must increase. Your reasoning is the solution is basic, or you are making NaOH or OH minus. These here are the substances that indicate that a base is in the solution. Okay, here is my summary again. I made the same summary for the galvanic cell, the electrolytic. This is all the information you need to know about the electrolytic. It shows you what happens in the reactions with molten sodium chloride, what happens with concentrated brine, what happens with concentrated CuCl2, and then you've got the things that happen for both galvanic and electrolytic. The anode is always where oxidation occurs, doesn't matter which one you're doing. The oxidizing agent always gets reduced. The electrons always move from anode to cathode. And then on this side, you can compare it to the galvanic question, which is question eight. And at the bottom here, there is this relative strength argument recipe. So this is everything you need to know for questions 8 and 9. If you're looking for any more revision videos, you can go to this website. And yeah, guys, best of luck for your exams.